International Conference on Automated Knowledge-Based Construction. I hope you and your families are all well in this unusual and difficult season. I hope that you're finding strength in the difficulties and opportunities to help others. I'm Andrew McCallum, co-general chair with Samir Singh, from whom all of you will also hear soon. So why last year did we decide to create a new conference? First, many of the conferences that we know and love have due to exploding interest in AI and data science become so large that they suffer under their own weight, lacking both the close-knit culture that longtime attendees cherish and also a manageable social atmosphere with breathing space that helps newcomers feel welcome. Broadly, CS is growing dramatically and it's only sensible for growth to result in new communities and conferences to foster them. And second, the time is ripe for new scientific advances uh, and impacts in knowledge bases. Research in knowledge bases is many faceted with contributions coming from many traditionally separate subfields, yet there wasn't previously a venue that brought us all together. AKBC strives to provide that venue. So next slide. So after nearly 10 years of highly attended AKBC workshops, last year we created a new conference with its first instantiation in Amherst, Massachusetts. Next slide. We were due to be in beautiful Irvine, California this year, but that will now wait for a future instantiation of the conference. And like so many conferences, we are virtual this year. Samir and the program chairs have done tremendous and creative work to make your virtual attendance as interactive, engaging, and scientifically productive as possible. And we encourage you to actively participate, to ask questions, to join chats, to find old friends, and also make new friends. We have a dedicated, energetic, and caring set of organizers this year to which we all owe our gratitude. They include Samir Singh, uh, my co-general chair, who also led fundraising this year and the creation of the online virtual conference tools. Also, Zachary Ives and Amanda Stent are workshop chairs. Matt Gardner, a local chair who also contributed greatly to the virtual conference. And of course, our intrepid, insightful, brilliant program chairs, Hanana Hachishiri Itzi and uh, Dipanjan Das, who will now take the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for the general introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dipanjan Das. Um, I will represent uh, the um, the general, uh, the program chairs, Hana, Haji, Shirzi, and myself, and I'll give you a, a set of statistics uh, regarding this year's AKBC conference. So um, we had an abstract uh, submission deadline first, and then uh, a paper submission, and we received uh, 91 abstracts. Um, after deduplication and some abstracts not following through to the submission, we had uh, 67 papers that were submitted. Uh, after some desk rejects and some withdrawals, 58 papers uh, went through the full review process, out of which uh, 29 papers were accepted. Um, this year's conference has uh, a diverse set of areas. They come from NLP and information extraction, question answering and reasoning, uh, uh, applications, human computation and crowdsourcing, uh, databases, relational AI, uh, knowledge cleansing and integration. We had 16 extraordinary area chairs uh, from a diverse set of backgrounds and research areas coming from all over the world who helped us review and select papers. Briefly, um, the conference, uh, the highlights are basically we have invited speakers on every day and then uh, paper presentations that would be live streamed from pre-recorded videos and also live interactions via poster sessions, both with the authors as well as the invited speakers. So on day one, today we have four invited talks from William Cohen, Yure Deskovec, Jamie Taylor, and Chin Luna Tong. On day two, we have five invited talks presented by Luke Zettelmeyer, Nadapa Nakashole, Emma Strubel, Andrew Su, and D. Yang. On the third day, we have three uh, excuse me uh, th uh, four presentations. we have four workshops on the fourth day on June 25th on four areas 
uh, natural language processing and data mining for scientific text, bias in automated knowledge-based construction, structured and unstructured uh, KBs, and knowledge bases and multiple uh, modalities. We had a best paper committee uh, formed by uh, participants and invited speakers and area chairs, a selection of them outside of the organizing committee, uh, Hung Ji, Ivan Titov, and uh, Di Yang, who helped us select uh, five spotlight papers. And um, the same committee also decided a best paper who we will announce at the end of the conference on the closing session. And we will also have a People's Choice Award. We will send out a link where attendees could vote on the best presentation, and that will also be announced on the final day. And now I will hand over to Samir Singh, who led the development of the virtual conference set up for AKBC. All right, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about what how the conference is going to take place. Uh, essentially, we have three modes of interactions for you to interact with everyone else. Um, the first one is going to be the live video sessions, um, where presumably you already are uh, by clicking on the live link on the website. Um, the second mode of interaction is going to be Zoom meetings, uh, and you should see these Zoom sort of pop-ups all over the website where if you directly click on the link, uh, you should be able to join without any need for login or anything. Uh, if there's any problem, do reach out to us. Um, and the last mode of interaction is chat rooms, um, which is available on the website, or you can go to akbc.rocket.chat directly and log in there. Um, same credentials as the website. Um, there are lots of rooms there. Each paper has a room. There are general chat rooms where you should introduce yourself. Uh, we'll also be doing announcements um, from us, from the workshop organizers, things like that. Um, and then if you have any issues or questions, you should reach out to us um, using the channel hashtag helpdesk. So essentially the virtual conference is going to have three kinds of sessions. The first session is going to be live session, which is this one. Um, it's gonna include the opening session and the closing session along with the invited talks, which is the, uh, the bread and butter of this conference. Um, I also want to say that the, we are also gonna be streaming the paper talks, although these talks are available on the website in case you haven't missed, uh, if in case you haven't seen them, you can see them in the live session. And in the end, we'll also have the best paper award. So all of this is going to be live um, through, through this, this stream. Um, our second mode of sort of set of sessions are going to be the poster sessions. Uh, these are going to be Zoom meetings where you're going to be interacting with the authors of the papers. Uh, to some degree, we'll assume you've seen the talks, but if you haven't, you can always talk to the authors about it. If you have any questions, any issues, uh, this is the time to chat with them. Uh, each meeting is going to have maybe two papers per meeting on days two and three. Uh, our last kind of session is going to be the hallway chats at the end of each day. Um, this is also primarily relying on Zoom meetings where you will be able to speak with invited speakers, uh, meet with them in Zoom meetings and groups. Uh, we also have um, rooms set up for uh, meeting other people randomly. So if you just want to not talk to the invited speakers and just hang out with other attendees, you can go there. Uh, and finally, if you're gonna have virtual booths set up for all of our sponsors uh, and you can go to them, ask them about their company, ask them about their uh, job opportunities and in this economic environment, it might be good to get a head start on that. Um, and so what I want to point out here is something like invited talks actually spreads multiple sessions. You're going to have, uh, you're going to be watching them live. Their pre-recorded videos are not available. And then you're going to be chatting with them during hallway chats. Uh, focusing a little bit more on the papers, uh, you'll notice that on the website, each paper has a web page. Um, which has the pre-recorded videos and slides. And so if you're specifically interested in a few papers, you should do that already. Um, we have links to the whole PDF, the reviews, the discussion on open review and all of that on there as well. Uh, we also have embedded chat um, for that specifically for that paper, where you can ask them questions or talk to other people who have questions about the paper. And then we'll have direct links to Zoom as well. Um, so again, there are gonna be three modes of interactions even for a paper. 
in the chat room. You can ask questions, have other discussions with them. Uh, you'll you'll see the live video stream of the pre-recorded talks during the lightning talk sessions. And finally, we have links to the Zoom meeting. So in, in the end, I want to, uh, yeah, we can next slide, yeah. In the end, I really want to thank our sponsors, SAP, Microsoft, Relational AI, IBM, Google, PIMCO, and Oracle Labs. Um, these guys really came through. I think we were, uh, not only are they supporting this new conference, but the transition from a physical event to a virtual event is, is tricky, especially when it comes to the logistics and the, all these companies have been pretty supportive of what we threw at them. So um, I really encourage everyone to go to their virtual booths um, for the companies that are planning to have those uh, at the end of every day. Okay, um, so that's all we have in terms of the opening remarks. Uh, we're a little bit early, it seems like it. So um, maybe we should start with the invited talk a little early or wait for a few minutes. Let's wait for a few minutes. Uh, maybe let's, we'll. Yeah, maybe it's, let's start at 11 18 and then we can hand it over. Okay, so, okay, we'll maybe start in five minutes then. Okay. I suppose people could use this time to make sure that they can log into the chats, yeah. maybe find some papers that they, especially um, whose chat sessions they want to attend. Okay. Um, I'll just share a generic um, set of slides here.
So um, I think we should get started. Um, William, uh, please start presenting your slides. Um, um, so uh, our first invited talk uh, for of the conference is by William Cohen. Um, William, it's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, he uh, is a principal scientist at Google and is based in Google's uh, Pittsburgh um, office. Before uh, being at Google, William uh, was a professor at the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University. He has had an illustrious career uh, in uh, machine learning. He was uh, the president of the International Machine Learning Society. Uh, he served as an editor of various publications, including um, Morgan and Claypool, a series of machine learning books, the journal Machine Learning, the journal Artificial Intelligence, JMLR, Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research, and, and so forth. He has been uh, a general chair uh, and the program co-chair of the ICML conference several times. He was the co-chair of uh, one of the first editions of the AAAI conference on weblogs and social media. Uh, he's the winner of Test of Time awards at both SIGMOT and SIGIR. He's a AAAI fellow. It's our pleasure to have him uh, speak uh, at AKBC. William, please uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Dipanjan, um, for the introduction. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. There's like not a whole lot of feedback with these uh, Zoom presentations, um, but uh, we'll try and do our best. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, it's great to be with all of you. Um, and let's go ahead and, and get started with the work that I've been doing, and I should say with many colleagues, uh, primarily at Google, a few at CMU. Um, so um, here's sort of the outline. Uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today is basically neural versions of an old AI chestnut, which is you know languages that are designed for querying a knowledge base. So this is something that people have been looking at AI from the very beginning. And we're we'll talking about doing this in a neural way. In particular, I'm gonna talk about a couple of different query languages. Um, one called NQL for neural query language and a more recent one. Um, uh, and um, once I've talked about those, I'll talk a little bit uh, kind of going forward. Um, this is some very recent work on uh, taking these query languages and embedding them inside a large neural language model. So that's basically the plan for the talk. And I'm gonna start out by just talking about why I'm working on this problem. Why do you want to neuralize a knowledge-based query language? What's the motivation for that? Um, so um, let's look first at a problem that probably most of you guys are familiar with, um, knowledge-based completion, okay? So knowledge-based completion, you've got some two true triples, which are you know, um, suggested by this uh, knowledge base in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and based on those true triples, you want to sort of extrapolate from those and um, discover other triples that are plausibly true given the ones that you know about. Um, so here, um, you know, I work at Google. My co-author, Haishin Sun, um, uh, is somebody I collaborate with. It's possible that he also works at Google. Um, so you'd like to generalize from the things you know to other plausible things. And the kind of standard way of doing this in knowledge-based completion is with um, uh, a neural function, which basically takes a triple and asks and scores it as to whether it's likely to be true or not. Um, and usually this is based on, is some function based on embeddings that represent each um, entity in relation. Um, so one very common technique, for example, is there's an embedding for the head and the relation and you add them up and that should approximate the embedding for the tail. It's the trans-E method. Um, uh, but in general, if you have any um, thing that looks something like this, if you combine the head and tail and you come up with some approximation, that head and relation, you come up with some approximation of the tail and you have some way of retrieving approximate vectors, say some sort of like top K similarity um, retrieval method, then you can also do this, use um, a knowledge base embedding to do a retrieval of and sort of answering certain types of simple queries. So knowledge base um, completion is not entirely related to the problem of querying a knowledge base, um, but it's also not entirely the same. So um, when you talk about um, querying a knowledge base in a traditional neural context, uh, you're trying to do something a little bit different. Again, you're starting with true triples, true triples, um, you know, facts that we know about, 
and you're trying to go from those facts to other additional facts. Okay, but the additional facts you're trying to find are ones that are entailed by logical rules. Um, so to make a plausible, you know, um, um, uh, example based on this case, supposing someone gives you a rule that says, well, if you work at, uh, if Y works at company Z and X reports to Y, then X also works at company Z. Okay, so if you have that rule, then you could extrapolate, if we have the right facts, we can extrapolate um, a new fact uh, uh, again, Shane, suggesting that Hai Chun-san works at Google, okay? Um, and if you think about it, there's actually something even a little bit simpler here, besides a firing a rule and sort of running logical inference until you get some sort of deductive closure, an even simpler thing is just figuring out how to evaluate the antecedent of that rule. Um, so um, the kind of primitive thing you can think about here is answering the compositional structured query, like this conjunction right here. Um, and these often involve retrieving things, okay? So a structured query is a little bit like a body of a rule. This is what we're gonna be talking about here. This is a sort of like the kind of first rung on the ladder of increasingly more powerful types of logical inference. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a very simple type of query language, which is basically a data flow language. So something a little bit like, you know, Spark or, or, or Plume or Pig, if you're familiar with any of these things. So we'd have operations that take for a set of objects, which just contains a set Google, and then you follow the inverse of the works at relation. So these are all the Google employees. Um, and then you follow all, another link to find all the people that report to those. So that's a, that's a very simple query language. It lets you answer a certain class of structured queries. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about here is neural query languages of this sort. Okay, and I'm gonna focus on ones that can reliably get the same answers as logical knowledge representation systems, but use differentiable methods. Uh, so we're really looking at uh, solving the problem suggested by this blue rectangle over here. Um, so we're looking at logical inference, not generalization in a KBC sort of case. Now, combining these two things and looking at things what you do structured query, queries and generalize is actually a very interesting task. I'll say a few words about it in this talk. Um, from the abstract, I believe that uh, the very next invited talk uh, from Yuri is going to talk about this in more detail. I'm very excited to hear about that. Um, but here, again, I'm focusing on basically logical entailment, not um, generalization. So why do you wanna do this? Here's a simple um, kind of motivating problem. Uh, and that is the problem of knowledge-based question answering. So a knowledge-based question answering, you start with a natural language question uh, like the one here. Um, and what you usually do is you apply some neural method, which gives you a semantic parse of that question, which gives you uh, some sort of um, uh, uh, symbolically interpretable um, uh, logical form that you can then run against your knowledge base, okay? So we've got one neural part of this problem, and then we have this one symbolic part of this problem. Um, so what we'd like to do is actually uh, neuralize the whole process. So if we have um, a neural knowledge base query language, then we don't need to have this um, symbolic step. And one advantage of that is we don't need to get training data, which maps us from the natural language query to the symbolic form. Instead, we can think about a process which goes straight from the query through the logical form to the predicted answers. And we compare those with the target answers. So we can do training um, in a more kind of end-to-end -end process. Um, so in this sort of setting, the actual query is gonna be latent. It's gonna just be something that the neural network is gonna have to figure out. Um, uh, it, and hopefully it's gonna be constrained by the answers you wanna get um, and other biases you might put in. Um, and the reason we wanna look at things that behave as logical systems is if these predicted answers are actually the ones that are entailed by the knowledge base in a logical setting, which is true at least for many of the data sets people are looking at now for this task. Then if, if you actually generalize the knowledge base in the process of producing these answers, what you're really doing is you're just sort of jittering what the predicted answers look like, right? And you're introducing something which looks like noise. So you're adding some plausible generalizations, but they're gonna be different from the target answers that you're trying to get, even if you have the correct underlying logical form. So in this particular case, generalization is not what you want to do. You want to get the same answers as a um, logical knowledge representation system. Okay, 
So uh, that's the motivation. Now let's look at uh, sort of uh, a first example of what one of these neural query languages might look like. Um, so this is some work that was uh, published um, in the most recent iClear, iClear 2020. So this was, this was done last year. Um, and uh, I'll start out with just some very concrete examples. Um, so this is a very kind of low level description, but you, know, in, you set up um, an object called a, a context, and then that object has got a bunch of functions that hang off it that let you declare the schema of the knowledge base, load in data, and uh, you know, declare types and things like that. Um, then you can construct sets. So the simplest thing is just to construct a singleton set that just has one element. So this string here is basically an ID for this particular uh, entity. It has type person, and we're just going to create a, a singleton set here uh, called Henry VIII, which you know corresponds to the King of England, uh, Henry VIII, who famously had six wives. And if I apply this dot wife function, where wife is a relation, then I'm basically sort of going to follow that relation through and find the set of all entities that are wives of Henry VIII. So all these expressions evaluate the sets. And in fact, they evaluate to weighted sets. So there's a number associated with every set. So here would just be 1.0. Um, and uh, we can compose these things. So we've got set operations like uh, this is a union and intersection. Um, so we can say, let's take the sons or daughters of Henry VIII. So that's all just children. And then we can take the sons of that set. Um, so that would be the grandsons of Henry VIII. Um, and um, there's also a little bit of second order logical reasoning, okay? So um, you can also have a variable, which is a relation. And then we have the special um, construct here, follow. So um, we can follow a variable of relation. And in fact, that relation R1 and R2 is a set of relations. So it's just another set. Relations are essentially entities of a special type in this framework, okay? So if I wanted to get grandsons, I would let R1 be son, union daughter or that doubleton set, okay? And I would let R2 be son. And then I get exactly the same semantics as, as this example right here. Um, and one thing that's interesting about this is that's also something that can be produced um, in some other way, right? So rather than have being a hard set, it could be a weighted set. You could have you know, some very approximate weights, maybe even ones that are produced by a neural function. You know, the semantics of this are all defined. Um, so, uh, uh, that gives us a possibility of uh, uh, learning these uh, parameters of the query. So the semantics for NQL are very simple. Uh, so um, every set is basically just stored as a k-hot vector. So um, uh, if you've got a million entities, that vector is a million components long. Um, and the weight for each you know, entity component is it's um, its weight in that set. Uh, so these context dot one just gives you a one hot vector. Uh, follow is um, uh, multiplying this vector by the adjacency matrix for the relation. So this is a very large, very sparse matrix. Okay, so we have to use um, sparse matrix technology to make this work. Um, follow a relation R basically is a mixture of these things. So you're just like sort of looking at a weighted mixture of these matrix multiplications. Um, and you know, k-hot vectors have nice properties um, if you want to do unions and, uh, and intersections. Um, so the implementation doesn't quite follow this statement of the semantics. Um, it's actually implemented with just three large sparse matrices. It's relatively compact. Um, you can actually scale this to tens of millions of triples um, on a handful of GPUs. Um, it does distribute. Um, uh, it scales very well with the number of relations, so it's fine if you have thousands or tens of thousands of relations. Um, so uh, you can do not inconsiderable knowledge base processing in this framework. Um, and let's, again, kind of drill in a little bit. So this is what the NQL syntax roughly would be for this. Actually, this, you know, minus one is, 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 uh, is, uh, is not uh, expressed exactly the same way. But this is roughly the NQL syntax. Um, so in order to implement a system that would do this kind of query answering, what we would do is we get some training data for the target answers, OK? And we define some sort of template that describes what the structured query is going to look like, all right? 
So the template's going to be given, and we're going to fill in the slots of the template, and those will all be neural functions. So we have some neural function which takes, you know, some representation of the textual question, extracts, in this case, we have basically an intersection of two follow operations. Um, so we're going to um, uh, basically derive the parameters for those, okay, evaluate them, get a predictive answers, and, and train through. And when we're training here, the um, semantics of the query language are basically the fact that it's differentiable is what lets us take these target answers, take that loss, and push it through the neural query language, right? And train this part right here, which is really the interesting part. This is the natural language understanding part. Okay. Um, so if we have a slightly more complicated setting, so maybe we don't know exactly what the format of our questions are gonna be. We might have to construct multiple templates, that's okay. In the simplest case, you can just take a new template and sort of add a union of that with the old template. Um, in a more complicated case, you might want to have some sort of neural function that sort of switches between those appropriately. You can even do something a little bit more complicated. So um, uh, in the iClear paper, there's a discussion of how to use an encoder decoder approach that would let you produce some very large number of NQL expressions rather than sort of like just a simple template. Um, uh, so how does this work? So here's some numbers. Uh, so one of the most widely used data sets for knowledge-based question answering is something called web question SP for semantic parsing. Um, it's over an old branch of Freebase. We're actually running over a subset of that, which has enough triples to answer all these questions. So it's about 40 million triples, about 12, 13 million entities. There are only 700 relations, uh, but it's a decent sized knowledge base. Uh, there's a relatively small number of questions. Um, Every question in the data set we have is associated with a set of entities that appear in that question. So in our uh, template, we don't have to worry about filling that in. We basically just need to fill in the relations. And all the questions are one or two hop questions through the knowledge base. So we essentially learned three relations, one that we're using for one hop questions and two we're using for these two hop questions. And this is the whole model that we need to use expressed in this NQL syntax. Well, almost the whole model the losses, soft max cross entropy of this output. And um, we of course have to define what these functions are. And the experiments I'm gonna talk about, this is the simplest thing you can imagine. So this is basically, you know, uh, a mean pool bag of word encoding and then a linear projection on top of that. So the, uh, the functions that produce these relations are extremely simple, okay. So uh, here's how this works for WebQSP and I'm comparing it here to a, a key value memory baseline. Um, uh, and um, uh, it works fairly well. One thing that's pretty nice, here's another set of questions. These are all one and two hop questions. So on average, there are not very many hops. Um, uh, this is another KBQA data set where there um, are one hop, two hop, and three hop questions. So these are nothing but two hop questions. And we can see performance drops off fairly um, slowly as the complexity of the inferences gets larger. Here's yet another task. Um, uh, so um, knowledge-based question answering is very similar to a certain approach to knowledge-based completion. So um, in knowledge-based question answering, there's a query which depends directly on the question. Um, in KBC, uh, in completion, you typically have a head, uh, a head entity and a relation uh, name. Uh, and the query depends on that. So you'll have many examples that go with the same head relation pair. So we'll have many examples. So the, the, um, the, the structure of the um, conditional control of this latent query is a little bit different, but essentially it's the same idea. You construct this latent query based on other relations and um, then you predict answers and get the loss. So here are again, some numbers. This is NQL uh, compared to a number of recent uh, or fairly competitive knowledge-based completion methods for the NEL 995 data. This is another synthetic task where we've sort of um, looked at things which have extremely long uh, deep uh, uh, inference chains. So this is like sort of 10 hop inference chains. Um, but we can see both of these things are pretty competitive. Uh, it, it's pretty competitive on both of these tasks. Um, and then uh, this is like sort of going back to the um, uh, knowledge-based QA tasks. Um, so we've added a couple of things. One is some synthetic 
multi-hop questions up to five hops here, up to 10 hops here. And this is a KBQA sort of setting. Um, and uh, this is now comparing with the state of the art. Actually, I lie, this is the state of the art at submission time of the paper. So things have moved a little bit past then. Past then. But these are sort of very strong baselines for these problems. Uh, so again, we're seeing NQL is, even with this very simple model, fairly competitive. Um, but it's not always the best. And there are some cases where it actually um, uh, underperforms state of the art models um, by a substantial amount. Okay, so um, what can we do about that? So why is this happening? So this is giving us the same answers as logical um, KR systems, but it's doing, it's doing it in what's arguably the wrong way. It's a very localist representation. These sparse matrices are telling you exactly what's in the knowledge base, but they're very hard to generalize. Um, and in particular, when you're learning a relation variable here, okay, that's a hard task. What you're doing here is you're predicting a K hot vector over you know, 700 different possible relations. So you're basically a, a predicting a subset of relation IDs for relations that sort of have arbitrary integer code. That's not an easy problem. And posing the problem that way ignores really a lot of the um, most interesting work in you know, neural representation learning you know, that's happened over the last you know, 15, 20 years. Um, so the next thing we wanna talk about is basically getting fidelity, um, faithfulness to logical reasoning in a language that is uh, able to naturally exploit um, neural representations based on embeddings. Okay, so I should say there's, there's a somewhat obvious solution to this, um, particularly if Yuri had given his talk first, you would all say, well, why don't you use something like query to box, right? Or in general, why don't you use some sort of knowledge-based embedding strategy? Those are all differentiable, right? And can we just simply extend it to handle these sorts of logical uh, queries? Um, so the problem is these things have been designed for and tested on this task of generalization, not on this task of faithful logical reasoning. Um, and it turns out, if you look at how they do on faithful logical reasoning, they don't tend to do that well. They generalize from the knowledge base, but they, um, from the existing facts, but they don't do very well at modeling uh, true entailment. So we're gonna have to add a few new things. So um, the two new things that are added here, um, and uh, I should say, this is also work that's very recent. It's in submission. There's an archive paper if, uh, I can point to if you're interested. Um, but the two new things here is there's a new representation for a set of entities. Um, and there's a new process for doing essentially the relation following step, which is sometimes called projection in this literature, um, which is based on neural retrieval rather than a geometric operation in embedding space. So I'm gonna take a couple of minutes and talk through those in a little bit of detail. Um, and this is work primarily with uh, Hai Chin Sun. Well, with, I say, with, it's like he's doing the work and you know, I'm here talking about it. Um, so, um, so this language, MQL for embedding query language, um, supports the same operations as uh, NQL. So externally it looks the same, but the representation is really different. So everything is represented, every set is represented by this pair, including a centroid and a sketch. So what does this look like? So, um, so uh, we're gonna describe two things. One is a geometric region where the entities, um, where the embeddings for the entities live. And I'm gonna describe that by just specifying the centroid, which sort of defines maybe a sphere around that, okay? But a sphere, of course, is not a very good representation of a, um, a complex geometric shape, right? It's not a good representation of a set if you're trying to capture the fine grained information in the knowledge base. So we're gonna to need to add a little bit of uh, additional information to help us memorize uh, details. So what we're doing here is adding here is something called a Kalkman sketch. You can kind of think about this as a continuous bloom filter, if you're familiar with bloom filters. So um, you basically sort of use multiple hashes to associate um, an, a, a, an ID of an entity with a number. So you can think of this as approximating a k-hot vector with high probability. So if the set is small, um, you can do this relatively well. Uh, um, and relatively well means most of the time you'll get the right answer. And every once in a while, you know, maybe one time in a hundred, you'll get the wrong answer when you do that query. Um, so um, 
Uh, it's a matrix that will typically be sparse, so it'll have a lot of zeros, but not an enormous number of zeros. It's perfectly reasonable to represent this with ordinary dense matrix um, representations. So you don't have to worry about sparse matrix math being uh, implemented in your GPU or your tensor processing unit or something. And these sketches are not large in our experiments. Um, so from this representation, what can you do? So the simplest thing that you wanna be able to do is actually find the entities that are in that set. So here's how you do it. What you do is you first find the centroid and you do a top K search on your table of embeddings uh, to find all the, um, uh, to find things that are close to that centroid. Um, so since we don't really believe that geometric space is gonna be perfect, we have to be a little bit um, uh, promiscuous here. So we're gonna pick more things than we think are going to um, be in the final set. One way of thinking about AK is it's basically a fine grained type for the elements in the set. You're taking all the things of that type. Those are the candidates. Then we're gonna rescore them using the Countman sketch. All right, so we don't sketch, so critically we don't query the sketch millions of times. We don't query it, uh, query it for every entity. So even though there's some probability of getting a wrong answer, we don't, still don't really need a very large sketch. Um, so um, if I want to predict a set, so let's say I've got a neural function that's gonna predict a set of relations, the problem now looks really different. So I have to predict the um, centroid and the sketch the sketch will just be vacuous, right? I'm gonna sort of put all the work that the predictor does on predicting the um, embedding. Um, so now what I'm doing is I'm basically predicting a point in embedding space, which is a much more structured problem for prediction. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's another kind of key point. So uh, Kalman sketches have these very nice closure properties. If you've got two sketches, one for set X and one for set Y, then you can do very simple operations on the sketch um, simple linear operations that will give you the union and intersection. Um, so if I wanna do a union of two sets, there's actually a very easy way of doing that. What I do is I simply uh, union the sketches using you know, these simple operations, and then I'll average the centroids. So that works great if the fine grain types are very similar. Um, and for the experiments I'll be talking about, usually that's all you care about. So the last operation is this follow operation. So I wanna find a set of objects X and I wanna basically follow a weighted set of relations R. So um, the usual approach in um, uh, knowledge base uh, embedding methods is you do some sort of linear transformation of that subspace. So if my set X is X3 and X4, I will do some transformation and everything else is gonna follow the same transformation everything else associated with that relation is gonna follow that same transformation, um, which may or may not give me the particular things I want to have, right? So if the actual Ys that I'd like to have, the things that are actually related to uh, X4 is Y4 and actually related to X3 is Y3, this may not give me quite the right result because of course I've got uh, a low dimensional approximation here. Uh, so what we're gonna do is something a little bit different. Uh, instead, essentially the idea is I'm going to look up some triples. So I've got embeddings of X1 and Y1. These are the actual embeddings associated with a knowledge base triple, okay? So I'll look up the right embeddings that go along with uh, X4 and X3, which would be Y4 and Y3. And then of course, I've got to push this back into a centroid sketch representation. So at some point there's gonna be a little bit of loss of information again. So we'll see how that works. Um, so this is essentially the idea. Um, what we actually do is we build a triple table where we've got three parts, relation, head, and tail. We uh, have a centroid for the relation and the head, and those are used as a query, and then we filter using the um, sketches. Uh, so this is very fast. It just uses one top K retrieval. Um, so a um, couple of details here. This is now where training a set of embeddings. So we have to do that. We do this by generating a bunch of synthetic queries. Um, uh, but there are lots of things that we can do in particular, if we want to bias the embeddings towards something useful, maybe using some sort of pre-trained embeddings, we can do that. Um, uh, and when we're done, we do the same thing we did with NQL. We basically fix this logical inference scheme and we train the rest of the model through that. All right. 
So here's some examples. So these are synthetic problems, and this is from Yuri's recent paper. Um, uh, so the state of the art for this task, generalizing using a query language, is the system query to box that I hope he's going to talk about soon. Um, so we're looking at that in a very different context. He's looking at generalization. We're looking at, you know, faithfully looking at the logical semantics. And the important point is there's a huge difference here. So uh, these are sort of in the 90s, and these numbers are often in the 50s or lower. And both things contribute. So MQL minus is using the retrieval, but not the sketch. OK, and we can see that does improve performance a lot, but it doesn't get you sort of all the way there. Um, and then finally, I'm going to look at this in the knowledge base QA task. Um, so uh, here's uh, these two kind of standard problems. Uh, this the three hop movie questions, uh, meta QA. This is the um, web questions SP. OK. Um, and uh, we're getting uh, better than the state of the art in one case, much closer to the state of art in the other. I got it. Um, and um, finally, uh, here's um, a little bit of an ablation study. So um, we actually didn't cover all the cases in that two line model. There's one more rare case. If we actually add that to the NQL model, then um, we uh, do get improvements over the state of the art. Um, and then this is again, ablation study where we disable the sketches. Uh, William, just a reminder, uh, we have two minutes left. Thanks. Uh, two minutes before I take questions? Yes, and we have a couple of questions. Uh, okay, ready. excellent. So in two minutes, these are very preliminary results, but these are things that I'm very excited about. So this is basically what I've talked about so far is building um, a neural system which is almost entire, entirely retrieval, okay? Um, but there's been a very new approach to knowledge representation that's come out in the last year or so. It's been shown that very large language models work surprisingly well for basically memorizing factual information. So they work pretty well for um, answering closed questions, uh, open book QA is sometimes called. Um, so if you ask a question, Charles Darwin wrote blank and asked um, Bert to fill in the blank, you'll get something which is right more often than you think. Now, of course, these also have problems. They're not interpretable. And to update knowledge, to add something new, you have to do completely, completely retrain them. So um, we've been looking at inserting this sort of neural knowledge representation into a large language model. So we're starting with this system called Entities as Experts, which I obviously don't have time to talk about too much. But essentially, it's got a component which does entity linking, and it has um, an entity memory. So every entity in its entity vocabulary will be associated with an internal representation, much like a word embedding. Um, and it works pretty well. So this is uh, its performance on a data set called Trivia QA relative to um, uh, T5, which is a language model that's many, many times larger. Um, so it does quite well on these sorts of factual questions. So the other nice thing about it is there's an easy way of taking this sort of model and extending it. So what we've done is essentially added another type of memory, which is a triple memory. So the transformer can construct a query to this triple memory, which uses the same entity representations for um, the head and tail as the entity representation. All right, so we're essentially adding something like a follow operation. So uh, this gives you an opportunity to inject new knowledge into the language model. So instead of retraining, you can just add some facts to the triple memory. And this is work um, with Pat Berga. And this is very new, but there are some exciting results. Um, I'm going to focus on this one right here. This is another knowledge based question answering system. And what we've done is very carefully constructed a data set where there are trivia questions that have entity answers. All right. And all the information about the facts you need to answer those has been held out, right? So um, the process is you do some language model training, you do some fine tuning on this data set. Um, and um, we've uh, ablated the, uh, the data, uh, the fine tuning data and the um, pre-training data. So you don't have any information about um, pairs of entities that link a, a question entity and an answer entity in the test cases. Um, so this red line here is the old entities as expert system. When you go from this normal setting to the um, 
zero shot setting, it's broken, uh, badly broken. Uh, its performance drops a lot. Um, but we can still get some interesting um, performance um, in this zero shot setting. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. There are a couple more slides, which are essentially summary slides. But I think it might be more interesting to take some questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, William, uh, for the great question, uh, for the great presentation. Um, so the first question we have here is, uh, you have done symbolic methods for KBC, the knowledge based construction, for example, PRA, as well as new neural methods. Have we lost anything by moving to neural methods or do they strictly dominate? Ah, that's a great question. So do neural mo models strictly dominate over PRA? Um, uh, so I mean, PRA is not uh, strictly symbolic, right? So in PRA, essentially what you're doing is you're, um, you're generating a bunch of paths which are weighted and um, you're combining them with a, um, a weighted classifier. Um, so um, I guess the real question is whether those learning techniques do better or worse than current neural methods. So there haven't actually been a lot of comparisons of Milau's old PRA system directly to kind of the more recent um, neural methods. Um, there are uh, probably a chain of comparisons you could follow. Um, so you can get a lot of the power of PRA using a neural approach where essentially what you're doing is using a neural controller um, to uh, select online the paths. Um, and my guess is those techniques do dominate. They sort of have all the information that PRA has. Um, one thing that they don't dominate with, which I think this talk is sort of trying to get back to a little bit, is um, interpretability, right? So if you have a neural method, which is sort of doing a lot of attention over many different things, and those things may not even have sort of a concrete symbolic meaning, then it's very hard to figure out what they're doing. Um, so I think trying to get back to cases where you can interpret what's happening, um, where you can sort of like debug, where you can control what's happening is a, is a very important goal uh, going forward. Makes sense. Uh, thanks a lot, William. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but there will be a hallway chat session in the evening with all the invited speakers. So please join. I, there are two more questions, so I will forward those to William. And if you are interested, please join at the end of the day. I will now uh, pass it on to Hannah, who will introduce our next invited speaker. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the conference. So now let's uh, welcome Yure Leskovich for our second talk. Uh, Yure, do you want to present your slides? Thank you. So while Yure starts his slides, so I just want to introduce him. Uh, he is a professor at Stanford and also a chief scientist uh, at Pinterest. Uh, Yure's research is uh, at the core of AKBC, uh, mainly machine learning and data mining with graphs. Uh, with lots of applications in computer science, uh, data science, health, biomedicine, and so on and so forth. Uh, he has received numerous awards, including a Lagrange Prize, a Microsoft Research Faculty Award, a Sloan Fellowship, uh, and also several Best Paper Award and Test of Time Award. Uh, so it's really our pleasure for uh, us to have Yure uh, accepting our invitation. So uh, please, you are, you are in charge. Okay, uh, thank you very much um, for, the, for the invitation and allowing me to, uh, to give this talk. Uh, I know we were planning to be together in, uh, I think, Riverside, um, but you know, it's also uh, good to give this from, from, my, uh, from my own room. So um, uh, is this a good way for me to share the presentation? Uh, everyone can see? Yes. Yes, okay, great. So uh, what I wanna talk to you about is uh, some recent work uh, we've been doing around uh, a new way to look at knowledge graphs and in particular to look about inferences and predictions in uh, knowledge graphs. Um, so this will be really about kind of reasoning and doing complex uh, uh, logical queries inside knowledge graphs, but uh, using latest tools from um, uh, representation learning uh, embeddings and so on. 
So we are interested in uh, knowledge graphs, which for the purpose of this talk, I will just define as these heterogeneous graphs between different types of entities and between uh, having different types of uh, relationships uh, between them. And uh, the way we can think of knowledge graphs is these heterogeneous networks with, um, as I said, kind of multiple types of entities relations that exist. And, and the facts are represented through the head relation tail type triples. Uh, for example, Alice is a friend with Bob or Paris is a city and, and so on. And we can take all these uh, triples, these facts, and combine them into this uh, large heterogeneous uh, relational structure. And then traditionally, uh, what, uh, what what people have been have been doing is is kind of realizing that these uh, knowledge graphs are often noisy and incomplete, and that one important task in this area is to do knowledge graph uh, completion or uh, link prediction, where basically we want to predict a missing head or a tail uh, of a given triple. So, for example. Uh, if we know that Barack Obama was born in the United States, then we may want to infer that uh, his nationality is American or something like that. All right, this is a very simple uh, inference. Uh, however, the, the goal of this talk and what I want to do is kind of, I want to suggest to try to move beyond this kind of simple single link knowledge graph completion and really start thinking about how could we reason over the knowledge graphs using complex logical multi-hop queries. And one way to think about this will be that we are basically doing this kind of uh, complex link prediction on a hypergraph. Uh, but let me explain what I mean. So what I mean is that we would like to be able to answer first order logical queries over these knowledge graphs. Uh, what I mean by that is we, we would like to support the existential quantifier, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. So for example, if a question comes, uh, which in natural language would be, uh, where did all Canadian citizens with Turing Award graduate? Then the logical formula uh, for this query um, is, is, written, um, is written here below it. And basically what we are saying is, let's start um, with a grounded node Turing Award. We want to traverse uh, to some node V over the win relation. We would also like to start with a grounded node of Canada and then tra uh, traverse over the citizen relationship to end up at some uh, node V. And then from there, we would like to go over graduate relationship and wherever we end up, this is the answer uh, to our query. Um, and the way, as I said, the way we can think of this is that we can think of this as a complex link prediction, right? Where basically given the set of grounded entities here on the left, it would be Turing Award and Canada, we'd like to predict a link to all other entities that satisfy our query. So in our case, this would be University of Edinburgh, Cambridge, and McGill, because Hinton and Banjo graduated uh, from uh, these universities, um, um, right? But for example, NYU wouldn't be the answer to our query or wouldn't be part of this uh, hypergraph uh, link that can connect multiple nodes on one end with multiple nodes uh, on the other end. If you look at this uh, carefully, you see that here in this knowledge graph, there is a lot of information missing. And there is no kind of direct path from the grounded nodes, uh, the two on the blue ones on the left, to the answers of the query uh, on the right. So um, what I mean by this is the way if the knowledge graph would be complete and we wouldn't be looking at this as a prediction task, then what we would like to do is we'd like to take this query graph and basically use it as a template to match it inside the given knowledge graph. So I could uh, take this, try to match it. Um, and you can see how, for example, this uh, uh, on the bottom on the bottom left, um, the, the bolded arrows, they show uh, parts of the paths relations that actually match to the target graph, right? So from, from Turing Award, I can go to Hinton. From Canada, I can go to Hinton. And from Hinton, I can go to University of Edinburgh. And that's one answer entity for our question. Another way to look at our query is to think of it with this computation graph, which says, "Aha, uh -huh, start with the grounded uh, nodes, entities, and then you know traverse the the knowledge graph according to this uh, to this uh, relationship called win, and another one according to the projection or traversal of citizen. Now take the intersection of these two uh, sets of entities. So this will be now all the people who are both Turing Award winners and Canadians, and from that set." take another projection operator. So take another step in the knowledge graph 
to end up um, over the graduate relationship to end up at the at the given answer. And that's one way how we could answer and uh, answer this query if the knowledge graph is complete. Uh, however, we would like to see this as a purely prediction task. So basically, we'd like to be able to work in the cases where knowledge graphs are incomplete and noisy and full of uh, kind of unobserved data or unobserved relationships. Um, and the links we'd like to predict in this case are kind of arbitrary because we don't know the query, we don't know the prediction task at the time of training. So we'd like to be able to make predictions or uh, predict these relationships within the grounded nodes and the target entities for an arbitrary uh, logical query. So uh, one approach how we could do this would be to say, let's try to uh, make the knowledge graph complete by doing the traditional knowledge graph completion task. And then, you know, let's try to perhaps assign probabilities to all these relationships. And then let's try to do the template matching the way I explained before. And, and this would be kind of super unscalable because link prediction would make the entire knowledge graph very noisy uh, and very dense. And then doing this template matching would make uh, everything even kind of even worse. So uh, what we would like uh, to do is we would like to use um, embeddings and relational learning to do this. So what we would like to do is we'd like to do logical operations directly in the embedding space. So rather than to kind of traverse the graph and try to predict each individual missing relation, we just like to take the, the logical query, represent it as a set of operators, spatial operators in the embedding space, and then do the reasoning directly in the embedding space. And uh, there have been uh, two methods published that are able kind of to do this. The, the first one uh, had the idea to basically take the query, decompose it into a set of logical operations, represent the query as a single, uh, single point in the Euclidean space, and then move this point around so that the entities that are answered to the query are close uh, to the embedding of the query. And then query to box, take this idea of box embeddings. So everything is not embedded as a, as a point, but as a, as a box, as a rectangle in high dimensions, so that we can then do intersections uh, over this uh, type of uh, operations. Um, what is uh, challenging here is, uh, uh, in this case is basically is the curse of dimensionality, right? So if I have my dependency graph here on the top, and then I want to represent this in this kind of box based uh, algebra, then basically what I'd like to take is this small box of Turing award, learn a projection operator that takes the box and makes it bigger, hopefully covering all the Turing Award winners. And then I would like to start with the Canada box and then apply a citizen relationship to it so that it will take this input box and transform it into a bigger box. I can then take the intersection of these two boxes to find Canadians and Turing Award winners and now do another kind of transformation of the box that will hopefully cover all the entities that are uh, the answer to this uh, question. Um, and uh, while this uh, works uh, relatively well, uh, the problem is that it can only handle uh, and and or. So basically, it's easy, it's easy to see how you can do intersection. You can basically take intersection of boxes. Um, but it's unclear how you could do, for example, negation, because a negation of a box is not a box anymore. So what we would like to do in this talk is we would like to uh, answer arbitrary uh, first order logical queries. So it means, for example, we would like to ask a question, who are the presidents of European countries that never held the football uh, World Cup or uh, the soccer World Cup, if you, if you like, right? So now we would like to do negation as well as uh, end. And if we can do these two, then we can basically also naturally model uh, or, which, is, which you can express with end and uh, negation. So um, this is what we will see how, uh, how, uh, how we can do. And uh, our approach will be that we want to kind of naturally model negation. So we would like to reason over the kind of the full set of the first order logic. So for this, it is important to be able to model negation. And if we are able to model negation plus a uh, uh, um, uh, 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 conjunction, so end, then we can naturally express or because A or B is can be expressed as not uh, not A and not B, uh, as I show here. 
Um, and again, as I said, if you would uh, want to embed things as boxes, then the problem is that the negation of the box, so basically everything outside the box is not a box anymore, and your representation uh, of this query basically gets can get arbitrarily complex, and then it's unclear how uh, how to do that. So uh, our idea is that we would like to embed arbitrary first order uh, logical queries in the embedding space and then do logical operators over this embedding space. Um, and one important uh, characteristic or property for us is that these neural logical operators need to be closed. What we mean by that is that the representation complexity must not increase as the, as the query gets bigger or more complex. Right, so basically, we'd like to keep representational complexity fixed, whilst while these logical operators can be arbitrarily combined uh, and can remain fixed size regardless of how complex is the query. So that's one thing. Another thing that we'd like to do is we'd like to naturally capture uncertainty uh, of the queries or of the answers uh, to the query. Um, and the last thing we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to reason kind of in this embedding space jointly in a sense that both entities as well as queries uh, that are kind of arbitrary will both be embedded in, in this same um, embedding space. Um, and our insight is to embed everything, to embed entities as well as queries as distributions. And we are going to embed them as beta distributions. Um, and the reason we want to use beta distributions is because they have a fixed domain. They are they're only defined on an interval 0, 1. And the beta density, as I will show you, is also a very flexible density. So we kind of have a way to approximate uh, negation, right? So we, we want to embed entities as, as well as queries as distributions um, or uh, in this uh, high dimensional embedding space. Um, we would then like to define logical operators that will take beta distributions and transform them. Uh, we want to, in particular, um, support and and uh, negation so not uh, so that then we can also naturally model or um, we will then also be able to handle uncertainty of queries because we are modeling everything with distributions so we can measure for example entropy and things like that to to, to model uncertainty um, and then once we have embedded the query uh, all we need to do is to check what other entities are nearby and uh, those will be the answers uh, to our query um, so that's generally the idea. Now let me kind of walk you through how we do this. So as I said, is we are going to use these probabilistic embeddings that will be basically um, beta distributions, where along each dimension in the embedding space, we will have an independent beta distribution. So kind of we have independent distributions along the dimensions uh, of the embedding space. Uh, each beta distribution is defined by two parameters, alpha and beta the support of the beta distribution is, to, is on the zero one interval and the beta distribution is very flexible. So here at the bottom, I give you uh, four different uh, shapes just as examples that the beta distribution can take. Um, and you can see this is kind of very, uh, very flexible. Um, so now as a, as a running example, I wanna be able to answer this query about who are presidents of European countries that have never uh, hosted a, a World Cup. And I show you the computation graph here in the middle. And now what we need to do to be able to, um, the, uh, to answer this query is to we need to be able to define this probabilistic projection operator that basically will take one beta distribution and transform it such that whatever are the entities uh, on the left after the transformation will get, will get some distribu new distribution over the entities that will correspond to basically traversing a relationship of a given type in the underlying knowledge graph. Then I want to define a uh, probabilistic or neural intersection operator that will basically take two distributions and do an intersection over them. So basically, we will have two sets of entities, two fuzzy sets of entities, and we want to do an intersection. And then we'll also want to do a negation, which will be given a fuzzy, fuzzy set of entities. We want to take a knot uh, or a complement of that set. So the way we are going to do this projection operator is that for every relation type in our knowledge graph, we are basically going to learn how to transform uh, this multivariate beta distribution um, into a new uh, 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 beta distribution. And one way to think of this is that this is basically a, a traversal from one fuzzy set to another, 
another fuzzy set according to a given uh, relation type. And this would just mean that we'll take the density and learn a neural network that will basically transform the parameter values to some new parameter values of the beta distribution. And this way, we'll transform the density or the distribution in our embedding space. Um, for the intersection operator, basically the idea is that we want to take multiple beta distributions and do an intersection over them. And uh, the way we are going to do this is very natural. We are going to take a weighted product of the PDFs of the input beta distributions, right? So if I have two beta distributions on the left and I wanna do an end between them, then I would get the, the distribution uh, that, is, uh, that is on the, uh, on the right. And uh, what is uh, interesting here is that first, the product of beta distributions is still a beta distribution. So this operation is closed. Uh, it's uh, commutative. So intersection of uh, distributions Q1 and Q2 is the same as intersection of uh, uh, distributions Q2 and Q1. Uh, it is self-consistent, meaning that intersection with yourself, uh, it uh, uh, gives you an identity. So it doesn't change the distribution and has this, what, what, what is called a zero force uh, uh, type behavior, where uh, if I have high probability in, in one distribution and high probability in the other distribution, the resulting, the, the result will be also high probability. But if I'm having high and low, then the probability will be low. And, or if I have low, low, it will be uh, low again. And this is what I try to illustrate here, where uh, again, we have the red distribution, we have the blue distribution, and the product of the two distribution is green. And you can see how um, it is high where both distributions take the high value and it is, it is kind of low uh, where uh, they both take or one of them takes uh, a low value. So this is how to define a, a intersection operator. So how can you do a negation? Um, it is again kind of a cool insight is that it's a very natural transformation of the beta distribution, right? So basically if you take a beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta and you take one over alpha, one over beta, then you would basically flip, flip, flip around the, the distribution. So for example, if you take the distribution on the left, the red one, and apply this negation where you just take one over the, the parameter value, you will get this um, bimodal uh, distribution uh, on the right. And again, you see that, the negate, that this distribution, wherever the red one takes high values, now the negation takes low values, and the other way around, wherever the red takes low value, the negation uh, will take a high value. Um, uh, again, uh, what is interesting is that this simple way of defining a negation allows you that negation of a negation is the original distribution as well. Um, so, so, so basically, you also get some um, logical rules or uh, laws of uh, first order logic uh, for free um, if you do it uh, this way. Um, so now I can quickly walk you through how this would work on this uh, World Cup query that we talked about, right? So basically the way we will do is every entity of the knowledge graph is embedded as a beta distribution. So it's embedded as some kind of density over this embedding space here illustrated in, in this kind of two dimensional uh, sub projection. So what we would do is we will take this um, uh, uh, beta distributions, one for the entity Europe, the other one for World Cup we will apply a transform uh, called uh, located in or uh, uh, that, will, that will give us a distribution, um, a different distribution over the embedding space that will kind of hopefully, that will cover all the Euro countries in Europe. Um, we wanna then do the same thing for the World Cup that will transform this and give us a distribution over the countries that have held uh, the World Cup. Now we need to apply the negation operator over this. So we'll kind of flip the parameters around the way we discussed and the distribution will, will flip around. Now we have the two distributions and we need to take an end uh, between, uh, uh, between them. So an intersection, um, this, is, this is what we do, uh, uh, this is what we do uh, here. Now we basically have a set of countries that are in Europe and have, have not uh, organized the World Cup. Um, and uh, now we need to, to do another traversal kind of in the knowledge graph along the president uh, uh, um, uh, relationship. So it will be another transformation of this 
uh, multivariate beta distribution. And now we have this distribution in the embedding space. So for example, we can now measure the distance between the embedding of the query here in the middle between the and between, let's say, the embedding of the president of Portugal versus the president of France. And uh, we can measure, for example, some way of a distance in the embedding space. We are using the KL divergence. And um, in our case, the Portuguese president would have a low KL divergence to the embedding of the query, while the Macron would have the uh, high uh, KL divergence uh, to the query. Um, now I showed you how to do AND and how to do uh, negation. The question is, how could we do disjunction? How can we do OR? And there are two options to do this. One is that is comes from the observation that any logical logical formula can be rewritten in, into what is called disjunctive normal form. So basically, we can rewrite it into a disjunction of conjunctions. Um, and this is useful because if we are able to answer queries with conjunctions, then we can just answer each conjunctive query uh, separately. And then the final answer is kind of the union of these individual query answers. Uh, this is great because now we have a very, uh, uh, very expressive way to handle this junction. However, this can be computationally expensive because rewriting the query may increase the query size exponentially in the worst case. Um, another option is to, um, to use the Morgan loss, which would basically say uh, re you basically rewrite or as a double negation of an end, as I show you here. Uh, this means that now the execution time will stay uh, constant or linear with the query size. Uh, but this will be a bit less uh, expressive or a bit less powerful uh, because we are modeling uh, union uh, simply as a and and with and and not. Um, and then the last thing that is interesting and that we can do is the question: Can we naturally also model uncertainty? Which in our case would be: Can we draw in some sense a connection between the entropy of the beta distribution and the number of answers the query has? So number of answer entities. And the, the, the idea would be that the more answer entities we have, the more uncertain we are about each of them. So we would like the entropy of our beta distribution to be higher for queries that have a lot of different uh, answers. And I will show you an experiment later that will show that actually we get very good estimate uh, of, the, uh, uh, of this without really incorporating it in the training uh, anywhere. So the benefits will be that we have now a very scalable and efficient method for answering any first order uh, logic um, uh, based query. Um, and at the end, all we need to be able to do is do k nearest neighbors in, in high dimensions. Um, this is very general because our operators can be kind of combined, chained in arbitrary ways where the representational complexity won't increase. And as I will show you, this is very robust to noise in a sense that we can really do in some sense arbitrary hyperlink prediction uh, over any kind of prediction rule, which we call we here call a query. The way we train this is that we basically generate synthetic queries. And then with every query, we have a set of positive entities and a set of negative entities. This would be entities that are answered to our query. Negatives would be entities that are not answered to the query, but are of correct answer type. So if the answer to the query is a human, then other humans who are not answered to the query would be negative examples. And then based on this, we can basically learn uh, our model, which means we need to learn the embeddings of all the entities, as well as this projection, intersection, and negation uh, operators. Um, and that's basically it. Um, our uh, experimental setup is focused on the following questions. Does our method generalize to new unseen queries? Does it generalize to new unseen logical query structures um, and whether we can model uh, uncertainty? And uh, as I said, we will, our, um, our evaluation will, be, be, will basically be a link prediction evaluation. So we will train on an incomplete knowledge graph. Um, and then we will only test on the queries that are not answerable in the training graph. What I mean is that every uh, test query will have at least one edge missing. So we cannot simply traverse the query graph to answer the query, but we have to implicitly uh, input the missing edges in order to identify the answers. So we, re we are really doing this kind of, um, in some sense, link prediction in a hypergraph. 
that's the best way to think of this. Uh, we are doing this over three different knowledge graphs, uh, free base 15K, 15K uh, 237, and then also on the NEL uh, uh, knowledge graph from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. We will have a set of uh, training query structures, which you can see here. These are path queries. These are intersection queries, as well as queries that are kind of intersections, as well as negations. Um, and then we are also going to evaluate on queries or query structures that we never see during training. Notice that these are different logical structures that the method does not see uh, during training. Um, what we find is that our uh, method here called uh, beta E um, significantly outperforms uh, previous methods on conjunctive queries only. So these are queries uh, that don't contain negation because prior methods cannot uh, handle queries with negation. Um, so this is what we see uh, here uh, on the left. These are the kind of training queries or these are logical structures that are the same as in the training data, but of course relations are different in the test set than they are in the training set. Uh, then we also evaluate on, um, on uh, logical structures that the method has not seen uh, during training at all. Um, and we have two ways how to model union with the, the Morgan loss, this is the N, and the disjunctive norm, normal forum. And you see how disjunctive normal forum tends to perform, uh, perform better. Uh, on average, we get about 18, 15% improvement over uh, query to box um, in terms of uh, hits at once. So in terms of predicting uh, the link uh, between the starting entities and the target uh, answer entity, where there is at least one edge missing along the path of the query. We can also do, do things. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. So we have about two minutes before questions. Uh, don't we have five? But uh, like 9.30, including questions. I see. I thought we started a bit late, but that's OK. I will finish. Um, so this is negation. Uh, it works great as well. Um, and we can also model uncertainty, as I said, where we can measure correlation between the uh, basically the entropy of the beta distribution and the number of answers uh, the query has. Uh, and we are getting much better modeling of uncertainty than uh, what previous methods are able to do. So uh, let me conclude. So what I presented is this notion of beta embed embeddings for answering logical queries or arbitrary logical queries in incomplete and noisy knowledge graphs. We can handle the, uh, the, uh, the first order logic. So means uh, existential quantifier and or and negation. Um, we can generalize to unseen, ex uh, unseen uh, uh, queries, uh, novel uh, logical structures. Um, we can naturally model query uncertainty. Um, and uh, the future work is, is really about how can we further push this and see whether there are even better ideas how to model uncertainties, how to define logical operators uh, in the embedding space. And in the last one minute, I just want to say one more thing is that as uh, people who are working with the machine learning on graphs, uh, we are realizing that we are lacking a diverse, challenging, and realistic benchmark data sets for uh, machine learning with graphs and knowledge graphs in, uh, in particular. So we have, we have developed a consortium and a working group called Open Graph Benchmark, where uh, our goal is to release, or we have already released, a set of benchmarks for machine learning with graphs, with data sets, uh, uh, the code base to load, construct, and represent the graphs, as well as performance metric evaluation so that model evaluation and comparison can be done very quickly and the research can, um, can proceed quickly. Uh, we have uh, different types of tasks at level of nodes, links, and graphs, different domains, including knowledge graphs, and different sizes from small, which is basically what fits into a single GPU, uh, to medium and large that provide a bit more uh, challenges. If you are interested, please uh, check ogb.stanford.edu. Um, so with this, I'm done with my talk and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Jure. Um, so uh, that was a great talk. So people are asking how to applaud. So we don't know how to applaud virtually. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. I tried to ask them according to the votes that each of them got. So first question, 
how do you translate the natural language question to first order logic form? Yes, uh, great question. Uh, that's not what we, I kind like our work starts uh, with the, um, sorry if I was not clear, but our work starts with the query graph given. So I kind of assume that the query graph is, be, is being given to us. I, I give it in the natural language because it's easier, but basically the way our work starts is that we get this dependency graph and we start from there. Uh, sorry if that was not clear, but yeah, that's a great question. Second question, um, Andrew Sue asks, in the abstraction of entities from points to distributions, what are the implications for the size of the training set that is required? Uh, what? Aha, you are saying because now our, uh, our, um, um, our embeddings might be more kind of may require more parameters. It is actually like at the end, our dim embedding dimensionality is increasing by a factor of two, right? Rather than having one coordinate along each dimension, now we have an alpha and beta along each dimension. So the, the blow up is, 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 not, is not huge. And, and we actually, when we run comparisons, we give all methods the same amount of kind of free parameters. So the methods that are embedding into dots into points, we give them twice the embedding dimensionality. So we don't get any explosion. So, so it, it is not an issue. Got it. Um, so one more question. Uh, the disjunction of two betas should be multimodal, but your use of De Morgan to capture disjunction doesn't result in a multimodal shape. Approximation regrets? Yes, so this is, I think, the, the yes, uh, that's a good point. What we are able to do is um, uh, we can basically, when we flip the beta, beta distribution around, we get from unimodal to bimodal. Um, it, is, it would be interesting to see, like, and obviously we cannot model, like we could not model along a single dimension uh, multiple modes. Uh, that is a correct, uh, that is a correct, um, observation. And of course, I think then it becomes a good question uh, at what complexity of the query will this approximation start to break down? Uh, uh, so, basically, I think the point is the following. There is a lot of impossibility theorems that one can prove around here. But if we try to be constructive and say what is possible and what kind of works well in practice, this is more what we were kind of guided towards. So I can ask the last question, which is how do we represent entity hierarchy? Like a car is a vehicle. Yes, that's good. So for uh, entity hierarchies, one, one idea is how you can represent this. It is very natural uh, to represent hierarchies in box with, uh, with boxes because you can make them kind of smaller um, and contained. You could also imagine that you could do something similar kind of with distributions where you take the, the more fine grained concept and kind of put it below in some sense. Uh, another good, good uh, uh, way to capture hierarchies is, uh, is, hyperbolic, is hyperbolic space. So we are actually right now looking into hyperbolic geometry because there you can very naturally and very faithfully capture hierarchy. So that's one of the pieces of work that we are kind of currently focusing on. Thanks, Yure. Uh, I think we are Thank over time. Much. We still have more questions, but please come to the hallway sessions. Uh, yes, Yuri can I be... will be half hour late to that session because I'm giving another talk. So I'll be half hour late, but I will show up and very happy to answer any questions people might have. Awesome. And I'll email you okay. the rest of questions. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, Thank you, guys. Thank you. And now we're going to be listening to the live talks uh, for the spotlight papers. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to share this video. I'm just going to play it. Uh, these are also on the paper pages, uh, but we'll have the five uh, spotlight talks. Uh, they're all about 10 minutes each, one after the other one. All right, this is the first one. Hello everyone, I am Fabio Petroni from Facebook AI Research and in this talk I will present how context affects language models factual predictions, uh, a joint work between Facebook AI Research and NLP Lab ITUCL. 
At EM and LP last year um, in this paper, we show that language models are able to store and retrieve factual knowledge to some extent. And we created the LAMA Pro to do this kind of analysis. That is a collection of closed style questions with a single token answer. And here you can see an example. The theory of relativity was developed by Musk. And we asked Bert to fill the mask. And in this particular case, it, it predicts Einstein, that is a correct prediction. But uh, storing factual knowledge in a fixed number of weights has clearly limitations. So for this other example, Giacomo Tedesco plays in mask position, Bert gets it wrong. Also as humans, uh, we don't always have the answer in our memory, in our parameters, but we uh, heavily rely on external knowledge, uh, for instance, from Wikipedia. So we can go in Wikipedia, uh, look at the Giacomo Tedesco Wikipedia page, and see that he is a midfielder. Uh, the idea of this paper is to integrate additional contextual information uh, into BERT in order to study its behavior. In particular, we consider four types of contexts, oracle, retrieved, generated, and adversarial. For all of our context, we use the one provided in Lama that often contains the true answer. For retrieved context, we use the information retrieval system of Dr. QA to retrieve relevant information for the question. And as generated context, we use the generation of an autoregressive language model. And this allows us to test the performance of a solution completely based on knowledge inside the parameters of a neural model. And, but note that the generation might not be uh, related to the question and also might not be factual. Finally, we test the performance of BERT against adversarial context by randomly sampling Oracle context from different questions that has the same uh, relation. And note that adversarial context always contains a distracting and semantically plausible answer. Let me show you some results. In this table, you can see the precision at one um, for BERT, that is the percentage of time it gets the answer correct. For the Google RE T-Rex and Squad datasets in LAMA. And when we consider Oracle context in input together with the question, we have a dramatic improvement in performance uh, for BERT on the LAMA probe. And this result shows the unsupervised machine reading capabilities of pre-trained language models that are able to copy the uh, answer from the context into the masked um, position. Uh, moreover, when we consider uh, the performance of BERT plus an information retrieval system, we uh, observe that it basically matched the performance of a supervised baseline. In this particular case, we use Dr. QA by translating each closed style question into another of questions. And this is, um, let's say, really impressive given that BERT didn't get any supervision at all for this task. Uh, when we consider the generated context, we have a slightly drop in performance. While when we consider adversarial context, the performance are more or less the same with um, no context or adversarial context. And these results really surprised us at the beginning. And we were not sure why this was the case, or why BERT didn't get confused at all by adversarial context. But then we looked uh, into the next sentence prediction um, pre-training task of BERT, and we found the answer. So BERT was trained both with mask masked language model, but also to understand if the second segment is a valid continuation of the first segment. So in this particular case, we mapped the question as the first segment and the context as the second segment. So 
we notice that if the context is relevant, the next sentence prediction classifier uh, always outputs a one, and the bird looks at the context in order to uh, do its prediction. But when the context in is not relevant, for instance, as in the case uh, of the adversarial context, we have the, the next sentence prediction classifier predicts a zero, and BERT does not look at that context. So it's affected by the next sentence prediction output, and the prediction in this case is equivalent to the zero context prediction. In this plot, you can see the change in precision at one relative to the zero context. And for BERT, using a single segment or two segments, so enabling the next sentence prediction ability. And also for Roberta, note that Roberta has been trained without the next sentence prediction feature, but it has the option to divide the input in two sentences by using a um, end of sentence token. And for from this bar plot, you can see that the best performance both in the adversarial case and the oracle case are achieved by using two segments, so with the next sentence prediction task. And by using a single segment, the adversarial context completely uh, ruins the performance. And for Roberto, we have a similar behavior, but is not as robust as BERT. Uh, moreover, we notice that the more relevant that BERT thinks the context is, the more we see an increase in the likelihood of the two answers. So BERT heavily relies on the next sentence prediction to actually decide to attend or not over the other piece, over the other segment, to do a prediction in a segment. Um, this table shows the percentage of time that BERT changes its output for the better of the worst. You can see, for instance, that when using Oracle context, it changed prediction 34% of the time for the better, and 7% of the time when the context is generated by a language model. So this shows that how the regressive language model can actually generate relevant context sometimes, and potentially serve as supervised information retrieval systems. However, BERT is completely unable to filter generated irrelevant or factually wrong information because he always thinks that the generation is a plausible continuation of the question. So here you can see an example. So for the same example as before, the generated context was how much does he play? He can play fullback, wing, or center. He can also play and the next sentence prediction score is one. For this reason, BERT copies the wrong answer from the context that is full. Here he is a final example uh, for a retrieval context. And it's quite interesting because even though the answer is not in the context, BERT was able to combine uh, this retrieved information with its own internal representation of knowledge to come out with the correct answer. To conclude, I think we should reconsider the next sentence prediction task because we show that it is an important component for robust exploitation of retrieved context. Uh, I also want to point out that the comparison with Dr. QA is not 100% fair because Dr. QA is an extractive solution, while BERT is an abstractive, and also the single token limitation of the LAMA broad is an advantage for BERT. Nevertheless, this work, together with a large body of literature in recent years, show that flexible and powerful unsurpassed QA systems might not be too far on the horizon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention. If you want to follow our works and updates, you can follow me on Twitter or you can follow any other among the authors. Thank you.
was my try. Applause. And here's the next talk. Well, hello, everyone. I am Priya from UCR Vine. And I hope you're doing great in the age of COVID-19. Also, the past couple of months show us that there are many things that are much more important than knowledge graph. But today, I'm going to talk about revisiting evaluation of knowledge graph completion models. This is joined by me, Yifan Tian, and my advisor, Professor Sami Singh. I'm going to start my talk by giving a brief introduction on knowledge graph completion. Then, I'm going to share the shortcoming that we find for the current evaluation protocols. And finally, I'm going to provide the solution that we find for this shortcoming, which is introducing Yago 3TC. Benchmark. Let's start with knowledge graph combination overview. Knowledge graphs are representation of information in the form of a graph where nodes represent entities and edges represent the relation between entities. Knowledge graph usually created through several sources of information such as unstructured text, structured text, and images. Because of the way these knowledge graphs are being created, there are many missing information inside them, resulting in creation of knowledge graph completion tasks. Here, the goal is to identify missing information using all kinds of other information that we have in the graph. For example, knowing that Barack Obama is married to Michelle and further Barack has a daughter named Sasha, our goal is to being able to predict that Michelle has a daughter named Sasha as well. Further, since we don't know then uh, non-existent links are true or false, we're forced to adopt ranking metrics as an evaluation measure. While in real world application, mostly we want to know whether information is true or false and we don't care about the ranking. More specifically, there are two fundamental approaches to evaluate these knowledge graph completion models. The first one is the ranking matrix, which uh, try to rank the subject or object of the tri target triple in comparison to the uh, pool of all possible entities, which again, doesn't correspond to real world use case in many instances. And further, triple classification, which try to classify each triple as true or false by learning a threshold for each re relation using the validation data. By that, I think we are ready to move on to discuss about the actual shortcoming. But before diving into the details, I want to lay out the three uh, negative sampling approach that we constrain this work. The first one is random sampling, which is widely adopted, and, re and replace the subject or object by a random entity from the pool of all possible entities. The second sampling that we consider is the constraint sampling, which uh, first filter all the entities that at least appear once with the relation of target triple. Then we replace the subject or object with a random entity from this specific subset. Finally, we consider careful sampling, which first identify all the entities that never appear with the relation of target triple, and then replace the subject or object with the highest score entity using the knowledge graph completion model. In this presentation, I'm going to talk only about three issues that we find in the current evaluation uh, approaches. I'm going to start with the calibration. We observe that calibration study is not well defined for these knowledge graph completion models. More specifically, in the Yago 3 data for uh, three models of Tucker, Rotati, and these models, which were state of the art uh, uh, results at the time that we conduct this experiment, we see none of these plots are uh, actually calibrated and they are, they are very under, uh, uh, under confidence. The red lines is the ideal model that we are looking for. We see similar performance for constraint sampling and as well careful sampling as well. And there are two points in this plot. Firstly, most of these plots are not uh, calibrated at all. Secondly, we see as we make the negative sampling more challenging, the behavior of uh, each model become completely uh, different and uh, demonstrating that uh, the ambiguous nature of uh, calibration study for uh, these uh, knowledge graph completion models. The second issue that we observed was semi, the existence of semi-inverse relations in our graph. More specifically, we observed that in WordNet 18RR, there are four specific relations that whenever we see them in the uh, tra train data with a high possibility, we see the same triple with the same component, but with the reverse relation as well. These uh, relations consist 40% of train data and 30% of the test data resulting in a very high performance of 0.9 MR on these triple. Similarly, on Yago 3, 10, we observe that whenever we see uh, in 80 percent of the time that we see a relation placed for between two entities, we see relation is affiliated to between those two entities as well. These uh, relations uh, consist around 55 percent of train data and 50 percent of test data, again resulting on very high uh, MRR performance. The problem with this relation is the fact that uh, since they are very simple to predict and they appear a lot in the knowledge graph, they, uh, they uh, result in ranking it not being able to reflect the same power properly. 
Finally, I'm going to talk about the triple classification uh, robustness. Here we see the, class, uh, the, these, uh, the accuracy of this class of tree based coordinate and Yago tree. Uh, we observed that we, when we train this class by using conventional way, but change the negative sampling in the inference time, the uh, accuracy dropped dramatically, demonstrating that these classifiers are very uh, brittle. I'm just going to point out that the current uh, trivial classification results it run uh, is namely around 90% uh, as you see in this plot. Now the question that remains is how we can resolve this issue. We are looking for benchmarks that allies the real world uh, application goals and further can properly differentiate between uh, these large recognition models and finally can capture these reasoning powers of these models. And the challenge that we are facing to come up with such uh, benchmarks is uh, basically the fact that knowledge graphs are not public. There are many, many non-existent links in them and identifying uh, any labels for each uh, fact is very hard and expensive. The solution that we came up with for all of these challenges and issue was Yago 3TC benchmark, which we created by firstly, select a random subset from Yago 3 uh, test data, then we identify top scoring triple from, uh, for each one of these target triple using a, a non graph completion models. And then we filter these triples using several rules guaranteeing the factuality of each one of them. And finally, we uh, get the labels for um, remaining triple using crowd, our crowdsourcing pipeline. In our crowdsourcing pipeline, after identifying top scoring triple for each target pack, we pass them through our first round of crowdsourcing with three participants. If just one of them think a triple is positive, we pass that specific triple through a second round of annotation with two participants. This time, if both of the annotators agree that the triple is positive, we accept the label. Going through our cross-sourcing pipeline, we could gather around 30,000 triples uh, from which around 10% of them has positive label. Now let's see the evaluation result on Yago 3TC benchmark. We first consider triple classification. In this experiment, we consider another baseline name as 5C, where as our classifier, we simply check whether the subject and object of target triple match with the relation type using training data. As we can see in the figure, these simple baselines perform very similarly to a state of the art result models, casting dot on the whole progress that we have so far on the knowledge graph completion models. In the paper, we tried to come up with several measures to improve the performance of these models, but we are far from the accept acceptable uh, performance. We further see a huge drop in accuracy in this plot compared to the previous result that we have, which was around 90%, uh, which we believe is a capture is the power of these models more realistic. We further conduct experimental calibration, as we can see in this uh, figure. There is two points here. Firstly, we see the order of models is reversed here, having the talker as the most calibrated uh, model right now. And further, we observe that now all of the models are overconfident compared to previous results that were underconfident, which consistent uh, with the previous calibration study on neural network models. Through this talk, we first observed that ranking metrics are not very trustworthy. We further noticed that triple classification is not robust, and these evaluation metrics do not align with real world application goal, resulting in creation of Yago 3 TC benchmark as the first step to, toward better evaluating these knowledge graph completion models. As a final note, I just want to mention that we, uh, we uh, intend to create a web hosted evaluation platform to continuously update Yago 3 TC using new knowledge graph completion models. Uh, in this talk, I had a chance to go through all of uh, these topics and you can see uh, uh, the website for our project and my uh, contact information here. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Aida. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington working with Professor Hannah Haji-Shirzi. 
Uh, we want to welcome you to the virtual presentation of our work on procedural reading comprehension and also thank our co-authors, uh, Antoine, Bahadna, and Yejin. We refer to process as sequence of events describing uh, changes in the properties of the main elements that were uh, participating in the process. Procedural text describing the process can be found in uh, various domains, for example, the cooking recipe or the scientific process or a ma mathematical problem can all be seen as a uh, procedural text. To give an example, here is uh, the, pros um, the procedural text describing a scientific process. Uh, we want to illustrate how we can map uh, from text to, the, uh, to find the location attributes uh, of the entities, fuel, and mechanical energy throughout the process. By going through the first sentence, the engine must be powered by gas or some fuel source. Uh, the reader can easily infer that the location of the fuel is now engine. Uh, but looking at the second sentence, the fuel source will power an alternator, uh, poses new challenges as uh, we see that there is a change in mechanical energy, but uh, the term, but the entity term is not explicitly mentioned and uh, the reader should uh, refer to the word power to, uh, to infer that there is a new type of energy that is getting created. We are also interested uh, in looking at the transitions that are happening from one uh, time uh, point to another uh, in the attribute values, and we refer to them as transitions. Uh, the pr uh, problem of procedural reading comprehension is a, a problem defined as given the input of uh, procedural text uh, and the list of entities, we want to track the attribute and transition values of those entities throughout the process at every time point. Uh, by doing so, we can answer high level questions, for example, what is happening to the fuel? And by looking at the table, we can easily infer that it's uh, getting uh, converted to mechanical energy through an alternator. Uh, procedural reading comprehension task poses new challenges. The main source of the challenge is uh, due to the then difference in nature of dynamic text versus static text. Uh, the entities uh, are changing. There might be implicit mentions of entities uh, or uh, the attribute changes. For example, if you look at the sentence uh, two, uh, there is no mention of mechanical energy or the fact that, uh, or explicit mention that the fuel is getting destroyed. Also, the other challenge is uh, due to uh, the fact that we want to predict attribute values as spans of text uh, instead of predefined uh, classes, which gives uh, the model more ability to generalize beyond uh, what we can uh, predefine for the for the problem. Uh, in this problem, uh, in this paper, we uh, introduce new formalism for modeling uh, procedural reading comprehension text. Each procedure is mapped to entities that do some transitions. We also uh, introduce DynaPro, a neural reading comprehension model that uh, jointly predicts attributes and transitions. Uh, the attributes here are predicted either as kinds of text or predefined classes. We also show that our model achieves the state of the art uh, and we provide uh, a multiple analysis. Our model DynaPro leverages reading comprehension uh, with including the entity ever context. Uh, the model predicts the attribute values uh, either as predefined classes or spans of text. The model is trained end to end uh, to optimize uh, the predict to optimize the uh, prediction for predicting attribute and transition uh, loss. And the output of the model uh, are both attributes and transitions. Uh, uh, that are uh, predicted over time. Let's start uh, with how we can construct an input uh, given process which contains a list of sentences, each individually describing an event uh, and the entity and the attribute that we want to track. Uh, we want to create uh, an input for times that k and for entity zero. Uh, the first step is to ask uh, a query about uh, the entity and the location. If the location is a uh, uh, the query about uh, entity and attributes. If the attribute is location, can ask where is the entity. Uh, also, if we want to ask up to uh, time point k, we truncated the, uh, the process up to time point k and we only include those sentences. Uh, we also include uh, notations of predefined classes and to have uh, potential uh, attribute classes as, uh, present as this kind of text. 
after constructing this uh, input, the uh, input is passed through contextual embedding unit in order to get NTBR representation. Here, the contextual embedding unit we use uh, is the bare embeddings. The NTBR representation is then used uh, for predicting attributes as predefined classes or spans of text. The predefined classes in our uh, situations are a nowhere, somewhere, or span of text. Uh, with the attribute uh, predictions, uh, we, uh, we move to create attribute of our representation. The intuition is to rescale uh, the, the original entity of our representation based on the published distribution uh, of the attribute predictions for previous and current time step in order to capture the change. The entity of our representation and attribute of our representation then pass to the transition prediction module, uh, which uh, classifies over four different classes, uh, destroy, move, uh, create, and, and no transition. Uh, in order to have uh, smoother predictions, we use a bias STM layer uh, in order to have uh, a memory of uh, what are the previous uh, predictions. Uh, for as for the experiments, uh, for our main ben benchmark, we use a uh, ProPower dataset. ProPower is a carefully annotated uh, data containing around 400 uh, scientific paragraphs for the training set. Uh, over the ProPower, there are multiple uh, test beds uh, and benchmarks introduced. Uh, the sentence level uh, task uh, asks about each uh, prediction individually if the transition is uh, predicted when and where it's predicted. The document level task uh, also uh, asks about uh, the high level questions uh, over the, pro the whole process. process. Uh, for example, it asks about the input, the output, uh, or what are the conversions. The action dependency task uh, asks if the transition that is predicted has a further influence on the uh, next predictions. As you can see in the uh, chart, our model Dyna Pro achieves a state of the art over uh, these benchmarks. Uh, we also did ablation study in order to measure the impact of uh, the different components of our model. Uh, we observed that uh, the uh, joint prediction of transition and attributes is helpful by removing that uh, the this migration uh, doesn't uh, do uh, has lower performance than the uh, original DynaPro. Uh, in order to measure the impact of attributes of our representation, we uh, did two experiments by removing the attributes of our representation or replacing that with a classification uh, token that is provided by BERT. And uh, we see that uh, both of these uh, variations uh, has lower performance that, uh, than the Dyna Pro. We also showed uh, the impact of truncating the, uh, the input by feeding the full context and observing that the results uh, are uh, much lower. We also uh, did qualitative analysis over uh, our predictions and we categorized our errors into three main categories. Uh, the first uh, category of problems is due to incorrect class prediction. Uh, we, we observe that in most cases, our model uh, tries to predict unknown location instead of uh, uh, instead of predicting unknown, our model is trying uh, to push for instead. We also uh, observed that there are incorrect scan predictions. For example, in the example, uh, we have to predict heart, uh, whereas our model predicts right side of your heart. Uh, the third uh, category of the problems are due to inconsistent transitions. Uh, we observe uh, that uh, as we build uh, the tables incrementally, there are uh, some transitions that are attempting to create entities uh, that are already exist, moving entities that are destroyed, or uh, destroying entities that are already destroyed. And uh, these are uh, the root of some inconsistency and errors. Uh, to summarize, we present a general formalism for modeling uh, procedural reading comprehension task. We introduced a neural uh, model that joined, uh, that is trained end to end uh, to uh, predict attributes and transitions. We also show that our model achieves state of the art and uh, over re procedural reading comprehension task. Finally, thanks for listening to our talk.
Hi, my name is Aida. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington working in the Prophet's Hello everyone, I'm Jen. It's my pleasure today to present a joint work with Yin Huma, Yu Wang, Stefan Grinemann, and Falk Tusk. In this work, we focus on learning from temporal knowledge graphs, where we use a graph hox process to capture the underlying dynamics. Compared to semantic knowledge graphs, temporal knowledge graphs of PKG for short store time-dependent events instead of set facts. For example, the GDLT dataset extracts news from newsletters and uses the key information such as the tuple of subject, predicate, object, and timestamp to represent an event. Here is a graph view of a temporal knowledge graph where nodes correspond to entities and an edge corresponding to a predicate with a timestamp indicating when this event happened. Since each labeled edge represents an event, we can consider a temporal knowledge graph as a sequence of events, where edges with the same timestamp are considered as concurrent events. For example, there are five edges in the first, in the first graph slice. We have then five concurrent events at the timestamp T1, so on and so forth. Based on observed events, our task is to predict links in a future time instance. For example, T4 here. There are several tools for modeling event sequences, such as the Hox process, which is a self exciting point process. Each event type K has a time varying intensity that represents the expected number of occurrences of this event in a unique time interval. In the Hox process, past events conspire to temporarily raise the intensity of future events. When on Eisner generalized the Hox process, by using a concurrent uh, neural network to predict the intensity function called the neural Hox process. In the neural Hox process, an intensity function jumps discontinuously each new event and then drifts toward a base intensity. And occurred events can not only raise, but also reduce the intensities. Therefore, the model can capture both the excitation and inhibition effects. Although the event time in existing temporal knowledge graphs, such as GDELT, is discretized, we use the Hox process to model discrete events in continuous time. The advantage is that we can predict continuous time when events happen. However, we can directly apply the Hox process on a temporal knowledge graph due to the scalability issue. More specifically, each possible link between two nodes represents an event type namely a, tri a triple of subject objects. The number of probable, uh, number of probable even types of knowledge graph is enormous. For example, there are 1.4 times 10 to the power of 10 probable even types in our data sets, while the training set only contains about 10 to the power of 6 existing even types. So the graph is very sparse. By addressing this issue, we developed a graph Hox neural network of GHN for shots that can be applied to large scale temporal knowledge graphs. In the following, I will take this object prediction query as an example to explain our model. Inspired by the score function of static knowledge graph embedding methods, we use entity and predicate representations to model intensity functions instead of using event specific parameters. Besides, we focus on the influence of past events that include the query subject E1 and the query predicate P1. We call these events the historical event sequence of this query. By predicting the missing object, we fit this historical event sequence into an RNN and compute the intensity function. But the model can still capture information from other events because there are shared values for entities and predicates. Modeling the intended function using entity and predicate specific parameters and narrowing the scope of past events enable our approach to deal with large scale temporal knowledge graphs. Continuing with this query, the red figure shows that the subject entity E1 form two links with other object entities at the timestamp T1. To summarize this concurrent events, introduce a neighborhood aggregation module 
that computes the mean of the object and values, where the big O represents the set of entity 3 and entity 4. Then we define an intensity function to characterize the graph Hox process. First, we fit the historical event sequence into the neighborhood aggregation module, and then fit the results into a continuous time LSTM. After the CLSTM processes all events in the historic event sequence, we concatenate the hidden state vector with the subject embedding and the predicate embedding. And then we make an inner product between this output and embedding of an object candidate as a similarity measure. Especially for the, I mean, for this object prediction query, we refer to this intensity function as a subject centric intensity function of predicting the missing object. For an object prediction query, we choose the object candidate with the highest intensity at the prediction. We consider the link prediction task as a multi-class classification task where each class corresponds to an entity, an entity candidate. For the time prediction task, given an event type, we aim to predict its next occurrence time. We compute the probability density that a given trigger occurs at time t according to the survival analysis theory. Then we calculate the expectation of the next event time based on the density function, where we use the trapezoidal rule to estimate the integral. We evaluate our model on two benchmark datasets, the GDELT and the SEWS14 datasets where the first one contains about 2 million quadruples. Table 1 summarizes link prediction results on both data sets. We see that our approach outperforms all other baseline models, different from the baseline models with discrete state spaces. We model the probability of an event in continuous time. Therefore, our approach can, can, can compute the event probability at an arbitrary time set which enhances our model's expressiveness. For the, link, uh, for the time prediction task, we propose a possible way to evaluate time prediction performance considering concurrent events. Otherwise, most branches value would be zero, as in a baseline model called no evolve. We compare our approach with LITSWE and no evolve since only these two models are capable of performing the time prediction task on temporal knowledge graphs. The figures demonstrate that our approach achieves competitive results on both data sets. There are several use cases of our approach. First, combining a data space of political events, we can develop a system to provide conflict early warnings. Besides, we can construct a temporal knowledge graph that, that stores healthy records of individual patients and apply our approach for risk assessment of patients. To summarize, we propose the graph Hux neural network for forecasting on large-scale large temporal knowledge graphs. We solve the challenge of massive event types uh, borrowing the ideas of the score function from static knowledge graphs. Also, we define a possible way to evaluate the time prediction and the new metrics on temporal knowledge graph modeling. There are a few interesting future directions, such as enabling induction on new nodes and developing explainable approaches for the link prediction task. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested, please check our paper for more details. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to introduce a new, simple, and effective technique for reasoning in knowledge bases in which the reasoning rules required to answer a query about an entity are derived dynamically from other entities in the knowledge space. Our approach is simple, requires no training, and is reminiscent of case-based reasoning in classical AI. I'm Rajorshi, and this is a joint work with Ameya Kotpole, Shazad Dhuryawala, Manzil Zahir, and my advisor, Professor Andrew McCall. Automated reasoning is defined as the ability of computing systems to infer new facts from observed evidence. We are interested in automated reasoning over large knowledge bases 
with rich and diverse semantic types. Knowledge bases provide an excellent aspect for automated reasoning. And here's why. The first step in creating a knowledge base is to gather a lot of text and identify the entities present in them, followed by connecting them with semantic relations. This figure represents a toy knowledge graph in which the entities are nodes in the graph represented in uh, colorful rectangles and the relations are represented as labeled edges. Even in this toy knowledge graph, we can infer several unobserved facts. For example, we can infer that Andrew lives in the United States by doing compositional reasoning on the observed facts that he works at UMass, which is located in Amherst, which is located in the US. Or the fact that I work at UMass because I'm a graduate student working with Andrew who works at UMass. There has been an array of work which learns this logical inference rule from data and stores them in the model parameters. This paper, we argue that reasoning can also be very contextual and the reasoning rules required to answer a query can heavily depend on the entities present in the query. For example, consider the following query, which is always there in every graduate student mind when they're getting ready to travel to a conference. Do I need visa for traveling to AKBC 2021? This translate, translates to the following knowledge base query. Now to answer this question, it would really depend on the, the type of passport I hold. For example, do I have a diplomat passport or not? Or the list of countries which offer visa on arrival to Indian citizens are the current political allies of India. Note, the reasoning rules would be different for other people. For example, it would be really different for Andrew. <laughs> Moreover, the rules to answer this question are dynamic in nature because they inherently depend on the foreign policy of a country which keeps changing with time. In a nutshell, to answer such queries need different fine grain rule for each entity. And hence it becomes hard to store all of them in the model parameters. Also, it's unclear how the parameter, the parametric models will adapt when the underlying data changes. The contributions of this work is to develop an approach which learn fine grain rules tailored for each entity by deriving logical rules dynamically from other similar or contextual entities rather than storing them in parameters. In fact, other than the entity embeddings, our model has no parameters. And, the, and since the rules are, are derived at inference time for each entity, it can handle updates or changes to data seamlessly. First, a small primer on what case based on case based reasoning. CBR is, is described as a process of solving new problems based on solution to similar past problems. <laughs> For example, consider an automated mechanic trying to fix a car by recollecting past memories of them solving other cars with similar problems. A case is an abstract representation of a past problem and its solution. CBR is a four-step process. The first step is retrieving the relevant cases from memory given a new problem, followed by trying to reuse the solutions to previous cases. However, sometimes the solution might not work out of the box. In that case, the solution should be revised accordingly. If, a, if the revised solution work, then the new case is added back to the memory. How do we represent a case in our knowledge base setting? For each fact in the knowledge graph, we connect a random sample of paths which connect the two entities in the fact. So a case is represented as a pair of the fact and 
a set of a random sample of parts up to a certain length, connecting the entities in the fact. We repeat this process for every, for every fact in the knowledge graph, and thus we have case memory. Now for a new, a new query, we retrieve key relevant uh, cases from memory. This is followed by <clears throat> gathering the paths from those cases and then removing the entities so that these paths are now just a sequence of relation types. This is followed by um, sorting them with, with respect to frequency. <clears throat> Next, we for each path, we symbolically match them to paths in the neighborhood of the query entity. Note how the first two paths get matched, but the last two don't because these paths don't exist in the neighborhood of the query entity. Lastly, the entities which are at the end of paths are returned as answers. Our models, our model represent entities as a sparse vector of its neighborhood relations. This is a very simple way of representing an entity, but it can be easily extended, for example, to include entity information in the neighborhood or can be re replaced by dense embeddings from trained neural models. Apart from these sparse entities, our model requires no other parameters and does not require any, any training. The similarity is, is the cosine similarity between entities. And for, for a given query, we consider only those entries for which we observe the query relation. Coming to the experiments, our task is knowledge-based completion in which we predict the head or tail entities given an unobserved triple we test our model on um, three academic knowledge graphs. And our baselines are several state-of-the-art parametric rule learning or embedding-based methods. On the net data set, our approach outperforms all other rule, rule learning or embedding-based approaches gaining over more than three points in accuracy. On the WordNet dataset, our approach performs competitively well with all rule learning and embedding based approaches, except for the newly proposed rotate model. And on the subset of free base, we not only outperform embedding and rule learning approaches, but we also outperform approaches which observe the logical rules required during training. Lastly, we find that our, our method is able to gather more fine-grained rules for every query type in the NIL dataset when compared to Minerva, which is an existing rule learning approach. Please refer to the paper for other experiments on low data settings and even more analysis. We introduce a general framework with a lot of exciting future directions. For example, learning richer entity representation and a better similarity metric, better matching of paths, improving upon our simple symbolic matches and considering subgraph instead of paths as solution to cases. In conclusion, we introduce a new approach that derives the reasoning tool dynamically for each entity and requires no training and outperforms existing tool induction methods and are compar comparable to existing embedding based approaches. Our methods have a lot of exciting future directions. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you everyone. So we're going to be doing um, poster sessions right now. Um, there should be Zoom meetings available for each posters um, of the five posters, go in, uh, let's chat there. Um, yeah, and we'll be back in about an hour. Um,
or the invited talk by Jamie Taylor on Google.
Nice to meet you, Jamie. All right, we're gonna get started again. Um, Jamie, if you could start presenting your slides, that would be good while I introduce you. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Jamie Taylor, who is coming up on 10 years now at Google, uh, where he manages the schema team for Google's Knowledge Graph. He joined Google following the acquisition of MetaWeb, where he was the Minister of Information helping to organize data in Freebase. Prior to that, uh, he uh, published a book on programming the semantic web and was the CTO of Determine Software. Jamie, welcome to AKBC. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be here um, and to be invited to uh, this conference. Um, so for those that uh, know me, um, it's, I think, perhaps... Um, a bit amusing that I've been invited to uh, a conference uh, to, to talk at a conference on automated knowledge based construction. Um, because both in the world that I work and my own uh, background, um, I actually don't know anything about the automated side of this. Um, the world that I work in um, is far from automated. Um, we have automated processes and things like that. But in terms of the knowledge based construction, um, the world that I work in is really one uh, of watchmaker precision semantics. Um, and you, you can imagine um, people putting um, very tight gearings together uh, to make very fine grain timepieces. And I feel as though that's uh, essentially the world that I work in. Um, we're dealing with uh, the very sort of tight integration of entities. Um, along very fine-grained semantic lines. And so um, when I talk about the knowledge graph, um, this is Google's knowledge graph, and I am coming up on 10 years of working on it. Um, the, the knowledge graph uh, grew from Freebase um, and uh, was a part of the MetaWeb acquisition. And so um, the knowledge base that I work on has been um, the same knowledge base uh, for 14 years. Um, and in an, its truth, uh, you know, maintenance and things like that um, is very long and enduring. And so literally the first assertions that went into Freebase are still the core of uh, Google's knowledge graph, even though uh, the scale at which we're working now is much larger than most people can appreciate. Um, we have uh, about 5 billion uh, entities that we're dealing with and about 500 billion uh, facts about those uh, entities. So um, what I'd like to offer today is my perspective on uh, essentially building 
uh, a knowledge uh, base, uh, one that uh, has sort of um, long endurance. And my perspective on this is really to sort of think about it as building a library. Uh, and I, I, I think there's still lots to be learned um, from sort of traditional uh, library sciences um, in how knowledge is managed. And uh, I would encourage people actually to shadow uh, a librarian for a day to really sort of understand the depth and, and sort of the breadth uh, of what it is that uh, librarians have to deal with. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, the acquisition uh, of materials and determining what should be acquired uh, and then developing the metadata around those materials and then dealing with the cataloging. And, and I, I cannot sort of describe for you how impressed I am with sort of the level of um, categorization that goes into library sciences. Um, they, they work from giant manuals and guidelines to determine sort of how to uniformly put all of these acquisitions uh, into their holdings. And then of course, there's the standard record management problem um, that we're all familiar with, but then also preservation. And frankly, I think sort of one of the most important things about uh, enduring knowledge bases uh, is that we actually understand how to keep them vital uh, and actually how to manage the preservation of them uh, over time. So when I think of a knowledge graph, I really think about it in terms of something like the Library of Alexandria. And that is so that once we've actually learned something, we don't actually have to learn it again. We can build upon a foundation uh, and use that foundation to actually enhance the new knowledge uh, that we're bringing into the system. And I think, you know, trying to understand how we manage that as it grows so that we can actually find all of this information and use it uh, in these ways is sort of uh, still a very uh, important trick that we are just barely getting uh, a, a toehold on. And so I, I think that there's still much to be done in just sort of the management of large scale knowledge graphs. Um, I think one of the critical things that I think about um, in terms of these large knowledge graphs is that knowledge is actually being written down. Um, and that is that, you know, once we actually know Angela Merkel's birthday, we would never encode it again. And I find it, you know, so uh, interesting and actually sort of wonderful that uh, Freebase, you know, is frequently cited in so many of the papers uh, at this conference uh, as being one of the data sets that people work on. My hope was always that, you know, the, the knowledge that is in something like Freebase or Knowledge Graph would long outlive me. Uh, and that's the reason that we want to sort of develop and, and organize these the way we are. Um, so the idea is that, you know, you can put all of this information down one time and it's in some machine readable format and you can actually manage it uh, at a very large scale. But even though it's in a machine readable format, I think one of the most interesting things about uh, Knowledge Graph itself is that it's actually very human readable knowledge. Um, and that is, you know, when I think about the quanta um, that is in Knowledge Graph, you can imagine sort of a, a wide spectrum uh, of describing sort of what's actually in the graph. And for the most part, what we have in Knowledge Graph is very discrete. Um, you can talk about sort of singular uh, facts that answer questions. The fact that you can actually use this uh, information without any context, um, it, the, the answers that are there don't depend on anything except sort of understanding the entity that you're obtaining uh, that relation from. And in terms of verification, um, it really is universal. We don't, we don't sort of want this predicated on some subjective understanding uh, of the world in which that fact was extracted. And so to interpret the data in Knowledge Graph, uh, you really just bring yourself and sort of all of the things that you know as a human being, and that applies to literally anybody. And I think this is really important when we think about sort of the ability to verify the information that's in Knowledge Graph and the ability to actually go and correct uh, the information in Knowledge Graph. Because one of the things that I'm really getting at is the idea that this data is uh, semantically durable. Um, and that is that I really see knowledge as something that ratchets forward over time. 
So the ability to actually observe what's in the knowledge base and then go and correct it so that new facts actually are integrated uh, better uh, and to sort of manage those facts in such a way that we're actually increasing the value of all of the knowledge as it's uh, accreting around those earlier facts is a very important sort of uh, methodology and, and sort of one of the um, important attributes of knowledge graphs as I see them. So um, for a knowledge graph, we have a few organizing principles. And one of the critical ones is a notion of identity. And that is obviously what makes things the same and what makes them different. And we express uh, these relations through what we think of as schema. But I think most important is also that we really see everything that's in knowledge graph as being discrete, um, and, and identifiably unique. Uh, and then that uniqueness actually persists over time. We can differentiate every object from every other object. And that we understand sort of everything about uh, an entity altogether on that entity. And therefore this requires sort of uh, the ability to actually merge entities together when we discover that we have the same ones and to understand when they should not actually be merged and how to actually cleave the world along these lines. So once we've actually gone through and identified sort of all of these different entities, then we can go and identify them uh, persistent, durable identifiers. And we can use those then as the keys to access uh, these entities over time. And literally things like uh, the identifier for toaster uh, has existed since about uh, 2006. So these are very long lived uh, identifiers. When we actually put the knowledge graph together, uh, one of the things that we think about a lot is actually how to classify the entities and actually um, determine sort of like what are the categories. And this seems like a, a trivial problem. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I find a lot of people um, in working with knowledge bases uh, tend to take for granted sort of the fact that they know the class of the entities that they're working with. And, when you actually start digging into how to define the boundaries of these categories and how to construct them in hierarchical fashions and how they relate, how the different categories relate to one another, uh, you discover that you know it, it is far from easy. So a very simple example, which is a real world example, um, we had a group that was interested in building up the representation of fire stations uh, in Knowledge Graph. And so, you know, I think everybody has a prototypic notion of uh, what a fire station entails. Um, there are fire people and there's equipment that can be used for putting out fires. Um, but the question is sort of, you know, what does it take to actually form a fire station? What things will be uh, identified as a fire station and what things won't? And as you start to go through the examples, it starts to get you know, a little bit more tricky. So if you have a volunteer fire department and they actually don't have a place where all of the fire people congregate and they actually just have equipment cached throughout the community, is that actually a fire station? And I think it really, you know, the, the, the definition of fire station not only depends on sort of like these intrinsic attributes around it, but also what you intend to actually do with it. And I think that's a very hard question to sort of get your arms around because you then start to think about sort of what is it that I'm going to want to do with this in the future and how is that going to actually be impacted by new data that I'm actually going to be collecting. And so as we went through and started to answer these questions, we thought, well, you know, we, we understand that most volunteer fire departments don't actually have places where the people uh, uh, are located all the time. So the idea that, you know, this is, this is where we can actually go to obtain fire uh, fighting services, that sounds great. And then you get to questions as to whether or not the dock that the fireboats are located on in different cities actually constitute fire departments uh, or fire stations as well. And so, you know, depending upon sort of the city, if you're in Venice, uh, if you're in San Francisco, fire stations with fireboats are not uncommon. So you start to think that maybe these qualify as fire stations if the volunteer fire uh, department uh, qualifies as one. But then you get into very interesting situations where you have aircraft that are located uh, at uh, civilian airports. And this is uh, an example of one of the largest uh, 
uh, firefighting tankers in the world located in Sacramento, uh, California. And so the question is now, does the airport in Sacramento uh, get classified as a fire station? Um, again, we have just sort of a cache of equipment that's used in a very specific type of firefighting scenario. And so, you know, these questions sort of like keep building upon themselves. But it's really important that we actually understand how to draw these boundaries so that we can actually have a notion of fire station which is stable over time and to which we can actually uh, accumulate new knowledge. So along with class identity, we worry a lot about um, entity identity and what makes an entity the same or different from another. And again, this seems so easy and intuitive, um, but the question is sort of like, on what dimensions are you actually going to start carving apart uh, different entities? At what level of granularity is it interesting or important to actually start separating these things from one another? And so, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, you know, I understand the difference between a toaster and a kettle, both have heating elements and um, one works well with liquid and the other doesn't. Uh, and then you add things in like blenders and you start to say, well, okay, so there's something else about these than, that I have to take into account uh, to describe them. And yet, you know, all of these things as kitchen appliances, you start thinking, well, okay, now we need to differentiate these things from other types of tools that are around the house uh, and sort of all sorts of other equipment. And you do this uh, for 5 billion uh, entities. And you start to just to decide that actually the decisions that you make today are very, very important. Because if you don't make good decisions today, essentially the problem snowballs in the future. One of my favorite uh, uh, entity identity uh, questions is around sports teams. Um, and so, you know, this is a question of sort of what constitutes um, the same sports team over time. Uh, so the Victoria aristocrats actually had many different names uh, over the years, uh, and they actually played in many different uh, leagues, many of which don't exist anymore. And so the question is sort of, you know, when does the uh, Cougars that were in the NHL differ from the Cougars that were in the WHL? Uh, and again, we have to sort of come up with very sort of practical decisions about these things very early on, so that as we actually obtain more information that in fact there was a Cougars that was in the PH, PCHA, uh, we actually understand how to separate them. So you could say, well, it depends on sort of, you know, the team name and uh, what league they were playing in. And then you discover that in fact, they've played uh, all over the place. Um, literally the same, many of the same players transitioning in th these different locations in these different uh, leagues. So again, you know, trying to figure out sort of how we're going to model these things so that we actually have consistency over time and we understand how to accumulate new facts onto information about sports teams. The granularity actually really matters uh, a lot uh, and you can sort of think about um, different ways of sort of breaking down the world. So, you know, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, um, great, we have a representation for that. How about Leonard Bernstein actually conducting Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? Well, Leonard Bernstein actually conducted it with a number of different uh, orchestras, including things like uh, a, an orchestra that was composed of many different orchestras and actually had many different vocalists. Um, so, you know, it, it gets more and more complicated and you need the ability to actually adjust these things. Um, and then of course, when you come to modeling it, you discover that it comes in four movements and that those are actually very important to be able to describe so that you can find them and annotate them with additional information. Um, I think, you know, again, it's very easy to sort of think that, you know, record merging and reconciliation and all of the different terms that have been applied over the past 50 years to this um, information sciences problem, um, you know, you, you, we want to treat it like it's a solved problem. And, and yet um, very simple cases like understanding sort of the relationship between um, all of the different uh, notions uh, of the story of total recall and actually understanding sort of the, the fact that, you know, books about that 
uh, actual production, then uh, develop names uh, of the production get incredibly complicated. And I have to tell you that, you know, again, sort of managing all of these different relations across media and all of the different names and things like that, understanding when it is that you actually have uh, a cinematic release and determining sort of all of the different formats that that release may come in and all of the different places where that release may have taken place um, are sort of a part of what it means to get your hands around uh, entity identity. Um, but of course, there's also relational identity. And so it's not enough for us to say we actually understand how to talk uh, about a structure's height, because of course, there's the structure's height, you know, with antenna, with mast, what was the highest, you know, occupiable uh, level of the building. All of these things have to have some relationship to one another so that we can answer basic questions, but we can also understand and answer more complete questions you know, that uh, uh, dive into the deeper semantics. Uh, I think you know, another one is you think about sort of like who is the architectural uh, structure designer. Um, and you know, it's very easy to attribute it to some architect, um, but perhaps it was you know, actually something that should be attributed to the firm attributed to uh, a, a lead within the firm. And again, we wanna be able to answer these things at all of these different levels of granularity and we need that representation. Um, and so this gets us into a world of really high precision semantics. And so this is, you know, as I was describing, uh, watchmaker, clockmaker uh, um, semantics. And so, we want to make the distinction between the religion and those practicing it. Um, you know, the island in, in which a country subtends, but you know, if that island, uh, you know, should be described as a geographical region separate from the country, we have to make those determinations. If you ever want to entertain yourself, go trace the history of the Remington Rand Corporation um, through, you know, the Remington uh, and Sons, through the typewriter company, Remington Arms, very Univac, Unisys. Um, it's a crazy timeline where you actually need to have sort of different levels of granularity and resolution to understand sort of how all of these things fit together and yet have a, the ability to talk about them in such a way that you can do the proper retrievals on it. So this really gets me to sort of like the core problem that uh, I, I worry about all the time, which is, you know, identity is, is very core to how it is that we manage the knowledge graph, but yet how is it that we actually make sure that we're not just sort of arbitrary in how we actually segment the world? And then once we've decided how to do that segmentation, how do we make sure that we've applied it uniformly? And so when I think about sort of like where this leads, it leads us to a lot of what I think of as semantic hand, hand wringing. Um, for all of the organizations that are out there, people want to be able to describe the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but Museum of Modern Art is, you know, a collection. It's a physical location that actually has subsidiary locations. It's an organization that uh, is responsible for the employment of people and for publishing books and controls the rights to a, a lot of media. And so we want to break those down so that we can actually answer questions and understand the world and the relationship between all of those things. And yet, when people ask us questions about the Museum of Modern Art, for the most part, we colloquially don't actually make these types of distinctions. And so the more I think about this problem, the more I start to think about sort of what I think of as semantic neighborhoods. And so there was a point in time where if you asked about the New York Times circulation and you thought about sort of all of these different facets of the New York Times, you'd say, well, actually there's a publication called the New York Times that the New York Times produces. And so therefore that must be what you're talking about. But in truth, the New York Times actually owned the Boston Globe. And so when I talk about the New York Times circulation, I should be able to actually say, look, actually I'm thinking about this at different levels of granularity and understanding sort of how to actually expand out this graph so that I can actually talk about sort of entities at different levels of granularity becomes very important. And so this is, I think the biggest challenge that we face um, as we grow very large scale, long-term knowledge graphs. And that is the way that we talk about the world and the way in which we want to model the world 
don't necessarily coincide. And yet it's the way that humans and actually a lot of the information sources want to talk about this stuff. So I say that I live in San Francisco and that I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. And the truth is that neither of those things are actually correct. I live very close to San Francisco and I grew up just north of St. Paul. Uh, but you know, for anybody uh, that I talk to who is not in that actual area, I'm going to talk about it in these very general terms. We want to know whether or not Tylenol can have side effects, but the truth of the matter is that a brand actually can't have side effects. The things that the brand actually produces and sells under that brand name can have the side effects. So these subtle things actually turn out to be sort of real trouble um, when it comes to semantic modeling. And so one of the things that uh, we've been experimenting a lot with, and I have to credit um, my colleague Andy Vajda for really opening my eyes to this, we had developed a lot of very high level uh, semantic relationships so that we could actually understand sort of the general notion of something contributing to another thing or that something actually had an origin. And Andy took these ideas and said, actually, when you start using them in combinations, you get very interesting results. So that if you think about sort of all of the sub properties associated with uh, a very high level notion of contributed to, and I say, I'm interested in, you know, what contributed to Star Wars, I then go through this list and produce some small result set. And when I actually intersect that against sort of all of the possibilities for origin two, it turns out that I actually get a very, very tight uh, result set, one answer, uh, Harrison Ford. And in cases where I don't, other interesting things start to happen. And so I think this ability to actually think about both very fine level, fine grained semantics, but also understanding how relationally loose semantics when used in, in uh, interesting ways can actually produce the same kinds of fine grained results is actually a very interesting idea that gets us out of a lot of this semantic hand wringing. So one of the things that we've found very useful in organizing knowledge graph is to think about very high level uh, categorically loose semantics as well. So um, we can you know, qualify things as being agentive or non-agentive, as being animate or inanimate, categorical or individual. And when we actually use those things together to describe the different entities, you start to see sort of interesting patterns uh, emerging. And so when you then combine these categorically loose semantics with the relational uh, loose semantics, it turns out that you actually start to also get into a fine-grained semantic division. And so I think, you know, one of the interesting things about sort of bringing all of these things together is that, you know, the semantic durability and the ability to actually have these types of uh, notions of semantic identity coming together allows us to talk about the kinds of strong identity that we want to have without necessarily going overboard into with precision semantic uh, instruments like we've done uh, in sort of our clockmaker semantics. So uh, I believe that durable identity is really sort of the way that you ratchet knowledge forward. You do it with some human intervention. And I think when you use it in combination with other types of semantics, we actually get a lot more power out of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I guess we'll start with the questions that we have. Um, the first question comes from Dan Bikel, uh, who says, it seems like the issues relating to granularity are intimately related to an ability to encode things compositionally, right? <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I would definitely agree with um, that characterization. Um, I, I think that you know, one of the problems when you start actually opening the doors to sort of compositionality is that, um, again, you want to have some sort of semantic description of how that composition is taking place. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, as we pursue those types of, of questions, um, questions of compositionality uh, themselves turn out to be equally as challenging. And, and actually, I, I feel that that's an area where we have um, lots less um, to fall back on. 
uh, that not uh, enough work has really sort of looked into sort of all of the different ways in which composition takes place. When you talk with uh, linguists, uh, many of whom I work with, um, I am amazed, uh, I, I should say, at the uh, level at which compositionality and language um, has been you know, studied and, and taken apart. Though I must say that, uh, again, it doesn't feel like we have sort of like um, strong bedrock to stand on there. Um, but I do think that as these two worlds come together, more interesting things will come out of that. Great, thanks. Next question uh, comes from Ann Kokos. Uh, it is, it's hard to get granularity right the first time. Do you have any rules of thumb you use to make it simpler to adapt the schema as time goes on? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, keeping schemas simple uh, is useful. I think, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things is to make sure that you don't paint yourself into a corner. And we have certainly made plenty of those types of uh, mistakes uh, and, you know, work. And I must say that once you've actually accumulated a lot of knowledge and it's actually in use, then trying to sort of like figure out ways to sort of back out of those um, problems are a real challenge. Um, I think, you know, those top level categorizations um, and using them to sort of like guide us in terms of the creation of uh, categorical structures below um, to prevent the types of conflations that we don't want um, has been sort of actually very instructive. Um, interestingly, I don't feel that we have sort of that same level of guidance uh, for relational semantics. And this actually gets to the compositionality question. I do feel that that's an area where um, we at least um, don't have sort of as much experience um, and haven't found as much to rely upon. Interesting, thanks. Um, next question is from Andrew Sue, who says, does your vision where any bit of knowledge was only structured once imply a need for a community knowledge graph? How do we, as individuals and companies, incentivize that? Uh, I, I, um, I, I'm wholeheartedly a proponent of this, um, which was, you know, in part my passion for Freebase and why I've been so excited with some of the Google releases. I really believe that, you know, in the current state of the world, Wikidata um, is really sort of, you know, um, the best opportunity forward for the community. Uh, but I, I do believe that, you know, more sort of community um, participation in sort of, you know, developing sort of uh, good uh, structural models and things like that, and good notions of identity is really important. So yes, I'm a huge proponent of that. Great. Next question is from an anonymous person who says, could you discuss the relationship between knowledge graphs and their provenance or evidence? Oh, um, I, very good question. And um, I, I think they are deeply intertwined. Um, and I believe that, you know, a lot of these questions about sort of granularity and things like that are answered in part um, through a good uh, management of provenance information. So that as you start to accrete things together, um, you actually understand potentially how they should be broken back apart for re-aggregation. Now, the problem, of course, when you do that um, is that the semantic durability, um, our ability to talk about sort of references and things like that um, changes dramatically. And I think, you know, that type of, of semantic management um, is again, an area where being able to actually follow the, the provenance of an object through its semantic life cycle um, is really important, but it really does, I think, in part, go back to sort of the origin of the data. Um, and it is, I think, an area which um, probably has not received as much attention as it should. Great. Next question is from Zach Ives, who says, regarding the notion of equivalence, as with your example of San Francisco, this often seems to depend on the question being asked. Is there a way to capture this? Um, I don't know, uh, I, you know, and, and I, I should say that um, we have, um, I'd say various cribs that we use actually a knowledge graph to understand sort of 
um, different levels of granularity of the boundaries that you might be drawing around uh, different uh, objects so that we can actually answer these questions um, in meaningful ways. I actually think though that part of the, the trick, and this is a, an area where, I, again, I, I credit Andy Vajda for having done sort of the most interesting sort of work, uh, is the ability to look at an entity and discover that sort of for the context of this question or for the, I should rather say, the answer that you're generating given the context of the question, it doesn't seem right. And therefore you actually want to sort of expand uh, the notion of that entity. You want, actually want to get into its semantic neighborhood. Uh, and I think the mechanisms through which you actually do that are, are very, the, the few that I've sort of seen in practice now are very interesting. And again, sort of like an area where understanding how these semantic neighborhoods are actually used, uh, I think is a, a very sort of rich area for pursuit. Great. Um, I think that's all the time for questions that we have and we can move on, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, and move on to our next speaker. All right, thank you. I'm uh, very happy to introduce our next invited speaker, Jin Luna Dong. She has been a principal scientist at Amazon since 2016, leading the efforts to build the Amazon product knowledge graph and also managing the team of scientists conducting research on knowledge management, data cleaning and integration, uh, um, information extraction, graph mining and embedding, knowledge-based search and recommendation. Prior to Amazon, she was a researcher at both Google and AT&T Labs Research, and she recently gave tutorials at Wisdom and ACL and KDD. Um, her PhD was from the University of Washington with work in databases, and she has a VLDB award in early career research contributions uh, to, quote, advancing the state of the art in knowledge fusion. So Luna really is the ideal person to help bring the database community uh, um, to AKBC, and we're so pleased to have you with us, Luna. Um, please join me in welcoming her. Thank you very much. So is the um, uh, screen sharing good? Uh, yes, it is. Looks good. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Hi there, this is Luna from Amazon. It is my great honor to speak here about our project Ceres, where our goal is to harvest knowledge from semi-structured web. And here I put a picture of the goddess Ceres and uh, she is in charge of harvesting. And the internal name of the project uh, at Amazon is a Greek goddess uh, with the same responsibility, but different nationality. Okay, so before we talk about Ceres, let me tell you a little bit about what we are doing at Amazon. We are trying to build a product knowledge graph with a mission to answer any question about products and related knowledge in the world. With such authoritative knowledge for products, we hope to improve Amazon search recommendation, voice shopping, and so on. To help you understand what is a product knowledge graph and how that compare with a generic knowledge graph, such as a knowledge graph at Google, let's see a piece of knowledge graph example for two songs. So it is a graph, so it has nodes and uh, edges. Each node represents an entity belonging to one or multiple different types. And for example, here we have two nodes for sound recording. And then each edge represents the relationships between two entities. So for example, for this song, uh, it has the same artist and songwriter. Uh, that's a person whose name is Taylor Swift. To understand what a product knowledge graph is, let's squeeze it to one side and add the product parts. So these are all of the products, the tracks at Amazon. And we can see that multiple tracks might uh, correspond to the same sound recording and they might have different formats. They might belong to different albums and so on. So to build such a product knowledge graph for media products, 
uh, we actually have abundant data and uh, the publishers for media products such as books, movies, and the music, they are very well trained to provide decent quality structured data. And so the challenge is that the different publishers, they use different format and they refer to the same entity in different names. For example, Taylor Swift and Taylor Allison Swift. As what we just heard from uh, Jamie Taylor, we want the identity for each object, each relation, et cetera. So the key thing here is to resolve the heterogeneity. Given a whole bunch of data sources, we want to integrate the data. And one key component here is entity linkage. That is to decide that uh, Taylor Swift from this source and Taylor Allison Swift from another data source actually refer to the same real world person. And then if we want to be cool, we also do knowledge fusion where we try to resolve the conflicts from different sources. If we see two different data verse for Taylor Swift, we need to decide which one is correct or whether she was born twice. And if we want to be sexy, we get the data from the web. And this is because there are so many different songs, movies in the world, and the web really gives you uh, a comprehensive set of information. So at our team, we are able to solve the entity linkage problem with a precision of 99% and recall above 90%. And for web extraction, we can do above 90% precision. So we are supporting uh, more than 20 Amazon Music applications. And also our web extraction is supporting Alexa knowledge graphs for Alexa question answering. So now let's see another example for product graph. This is for retail products. So there are two products which are tight detergent products, those two brown bubbles, and those green bubbles represent their variations with different scent, different sizes. And then we see they share a lot of property. Uh, for example, they have the same brand, same function. Uh, they have the same form, both are liquid. And um, neither of them is a high efficiency. And uh, the product on the left-hand side, uh, it has one extra function, auto remover. So, Talking about retail products, here we don't have that much of data anymore. And this is because retailers are not trained to provide structured information. Instead, they put the majority of the information for products into the texts, such as the titles and the descriptions of the products. So structured data is sparse and noisy. Just uh, let's see this example from uh, Amazon. This is some chocolate product and we see very sparse information except the title. And even if we see some uh, structured data like the flavors and the sizes, but you really don't feel this one pound red rose box is a flavor and dark blue foils is size. So to resolve this challenge, what we need to do is we take the data from catalog and then we need to enrich it using data imputation. After that, we need to do data cleaning to clean up all of the messes. So uh, at our, uh, our team, we have uh, developed this system called AutoKnow, which is self-driving knowledge collection system for products from many, many different product types. And we are able to increase the coverage of structured data by 12 times and increase the accuracy of the data from Amazon catalog by 8%. Currently, this is live on Alexa shopping, Amazon search, detail page, and so on. So for this talk, I will focus on web extraction. So although this is just the one component of this big system, but as I said, this is the sexy component, and this is important for us to collect long tail knowledge to support Alexa question answering. Okay, so Ceres extract knowledge from semi-structured websites. And why do we focus on semi-structured websites? Let's first see a few examples. So here is a web page from IMDb. And we see that it is not a big article or a huge chunk of texts. 
Instead, we see a lot of attribute value pairs that gives us information about this movie. Here is another web page from a different website about a famous Indian movie. And here is one about a famous Chinese movie, and it is in Chinese. And uh, most of the semi-structured websites, they are populated by some underlying giant databases and uh, according to some particular templates. So different pages on the website look very similar. So we have observed a big promise from semi-structured data. Uh, this is according to the previous project I participated in at Google called Knowledge Vault. The goal of Knowledge Vault is to extract knowledge from all over the web. And in particular, we consider four sources four types of uh, knowledge sources. The first one is texts, the articles on the web, such as news articles. The second one is DOM trees, and this is the semi-structured websites we have just the same. The third one is web tables, the tabular information on the web pages. And the last one is web annotations according to schema.org in the HTML code. And uh, the parentheses gives the number of knowledge triples we extracted automatically from each type of data sources. And we can see that 80% of the knowledge are extracted from semi-structured websites. And uh, if we look at the extraction accuracy from Knowledge Vault, it is 52% for web texts and 63% um, for the semi-structured data. It is better, even though it is not, not ideal yet. So let's see, uh, what are the opportunities from semi-structured data? And here I want to use the largest iceberg in the world as a metaphor. And this is partially because semi-structured data is like a huge iceberg with a lot of information. And uh, here is a page from uh, Rotten Tomatoes about the movie When Harry Met Sally. And we can see the information on some of the attributes for the movie that we are familiar with, such as the genre, the director, the writer. And these are the information normally uh, modeled by ontologies such as the Freebase ontologies, as we have just heard from Jamie Taylor. And uh, this correspond to the part of the iceberg that is above the water. And in addition, there are attributes that we are not familiar with, such as in theaters on district streaming time. And uh, we did some analysis on 10 popular semi-structured movie websites. And uh, we look at IMDb ontology and found that the attributes mentioned in IMDb, which is quite comprehensive, covers only 7% of all of the relations modeled by these 10 semi-structured websites. And so the information here is like the part of the iceberg below the water. In addition, there are a lot of domains such as the Broadway shows, the video games. Uh, these are the unknown domains and they are like the part of the iceberg that is deep in the water. <clears throat> So where were we in the extraction now? Well, we are at the tip. So we heavily rely on manual annotations to reach high precision. And uh, as I said, for automatic extraction, uh, the precision could be quite low, 60%. That is definitely not enough for industry production. And also we are restricted to existing schema from existing domains. And uh, we have good quality typically only on easy attributes, like the attributes with single value, like the data birth. So why is this so hard? It seems to be quite regular web pages. Why is it uh, hard to get good results? There are at least the three challenges for knowledge extraction from semi-structured web. The first one is, even though in the same website, the web pages look quite similar, populated by the same template, the formatting can still vary slightly. Look at these two pages from IMDb, and we can see that because of some missing attribute, etc., uh, the layout is not exactly the same. And the second, the data could be formatted totally different uh, from different websites. 
And it is hard to imagine to train one single model to extract from all of these different data sources. And finally, uh, with the big variety from different websites, because there are so many different semi-structured websites, it's impossible to manually collect the training data for each predicate on each website. So where is the hope? Can we get the whole iceberg? <clears throat> So to answer this question, let's first see what are the clues to do extraction from semi-structured websites. The first one with no surprise is the DOM tree. So this is an IMDB web page and this is the HTML code behind it. And we can see that these are nodes in the tree structure and each node has an HTML tag and uh, meanwhile, it has the ID, the class, and also the text information. So uh, this gives the traditional methods. The first one is wrapper induction. Uh, we collect annotations for each single attribute. And then we try to reverse engineer what is the X pass to extract such information like here. And uh, wrapper induction could get very high precision, about 95%. However, this requires a lot of manual annotation. And an automatic solution tries to train extraction models using distance supervision. And here we look at some seed knowledge, for example, from IMDB. And we look at the subject and the object on each page, and then try to apply distance supervision to automatically generate the training data. The training data is very noisy. And so the extraction precision is only 63%. So the next clue is the site-wide template. As we said, all pages are generated from the same template in the website. So we try to um, leverage the consistency among the different web pages. This gives autoservice, which can do automatic extraction from the websites with much higher precision. And there are two technical uh, points behind this project. So first, it leveraged the site-wide global information. So it does not train a model just by looking at uh, each single page. page. It does not uh, generate the training data by just looking at each single page. And it tried to make the page level local decision according to the global consistency. And the second, it does two-stage extraction. It first identify the topic entity or the subject from each page, and then identify the attribute value pairs for that subject. With these two key intuitions, we are able to increase the precision from 63% to 90%. 90% basically means now there is hope to productionize it. So this is some results from an experiment where we look at 33 long tail movie websites, including 400K different web pages, uh, crowd by Common Prowl. It has English and six other languages and it has a lot of long tail domains such as animated films, documentary films, and so on. So we are able to automatically annotate 16% of all of the pages for every annotated page uh, or every annotated entity, we are able to extract 2.6 entities, meaning 1.6 new entities. And for every annotated triple, we are able to extract three triples, meaning two new triples. And this gives us an extraction of 1.25 millions of triples with a precision 90%. And as this plot shows, as we vary the confidence threshold, we are able to control the precision. At this point, we get the precision of 90% with 1.25 millions of triples. Okay, the next clue, if we look at the page, actually there is a lot of uh, information hidden in the layout. So let's look at these three attributes we already know, and we see how they are vertically aligned and horizontally aligned. And this helps us to guess in theaters is another predicate and the value is July 12th. So 
using this kind of clue, we worked on this project called Open Series, which allows open information extraction to extract knowledge for attributes that we don't know yet, not in any existing ontology. So the key technical idea is weak learning. We generate the weak labels according to the labels that are generated using the seed knowledge. The precision is lower, it is 65%. However, we can increase the number of attributes by 10 times. Here are the examples of um, how we can enlarge uh, the set of attributes. Taking university as an example, our seed knowledge contains only three attributes, phone number, web address, and the type. And we are able to identify a lot of new attributes like the calendar system, enrollment, highest degree local area, so on and so forth. So this is um, extraction on the same set of long tail movie websites. Uh, this purple line is for closed IE for auto service. And this green line is for open IE for open service. We see that we added significantly am significant amount of knowledge. And on the other hand, if we look at the knowledge for newly discovered attributes, so the precision is still low and we still need to work on increasing the precision. With that, we can go from the, uh, the iceberg above the water to somewhere below the water. Okay, the final set of clue is the visual patterns. And before I tell you what is the visual pattern, I want to do a quiz with you. So I don't know how many people in the audience understand Korean. So um, I'm hoping actually most of the people don't understand what this page is about. However, even though you may not understand the page, you may not understand every single Korean word on this page, you might be able to guess what is the topic entity on this page. So that is this part. This part represents the topic entity, the subject. And which part represents an attribute for this topic entity? All of this should be, and here is an example. And what are the values for this attribute? Uh, this is one value, and there can be a few other values. What are other possible values? This is possibly another value, even though we don't know which is the predicate. So see, even if it is a page you have never seen before and you even do not understand, as human beings, we can reason about it. So what is the underlying pattern behind it? And that's the visual pattern. So this includes the font, the color, the size, and also the location of the text on the whole page and the alignment of the uh, text fields. So leveraging this, um, intuition, we got zero shot service, which allows us to extract knowledge for new domains where we even do not have any seed knowledge. So the key technical uh, part is a graph neural network. And uh, we use that to learn representations for each text field. So our F measure is 46%, uh, both precision and recall is around 45%. This is not high, but comparing with baselines, um, like looking at the semicolon, we uh, significantly increase the recall. So uh, here is the extraction uh, on all of the domains where uh, we might have the training data and also on the domains where we do not have the training data. We can see that for those new domains, our result is only slightly worse. And this gives us the whole iceberg. Okay. So next, let me talk a little bit about how we do such zero shot extraction. And this is our latest results and how we leverage all of the evidence I have just mentioned. And uh, here I want to call out the key contributors for this project. So the key technique, as I said, is to leverage the graph neural network. And uh, to apply graph neural network, we need a graph. And the graph is generated according to the page layout. Each node is a text field and the edge represents their um, 
layout relationships or DOM relationships. The purple lines, purple edges represent the left and the right relationship. And the yellow edges represent the up and the down uh, relationships. And uh, the green lines represent the DOM relationships. Uh, basically, these are nodes that are siblings or cousins in the DOM tree. Look that cast and the crew, even though they are a little bit far away on the page, but on the DOM tree, they are siblings. And for each text field, we look at two different kinds of features, the textual feature uh, from bird embedding, from the IDF across the website. Cast will appear very often on different websites, whereas particular person names will not appear that often. And also the text lens. And for the visual feature, we look at the font size, whether it is bold, underlined, italic, what is the font color, what is the text field dimensions. So let's use this as an example to see how we train the model. For this mid college with acceptance rate and tuition, uh, we get the visual and the text uh, features for each field. And meanwhile, we get the page layout graph. We feed that into a graph attention network, and uh, this allows us to propagate the information uh, among the neighbors. And then we can get the context representation of each text field. To do closed IE extraction, uh, where we extract using existing attribute set or ontology, we take the visual feature, the textual feature, and the ontology. Uh, contextual features and uh, feed it into a multi-class classifier to decide for this particular text field what relation it is talking about. And uh, for OpenIE, we take a pair of text fields like tuition and $53,000 and uh, we generate uh, the, some pairwise features by combining the, uh, their individual features and feed all of them into a binary classifier to decide whether that's attribute value pairs. And for training, we have a pre-trained step uh, on simplified IE tasks. So basically we try to decide for each text field, whether it is a relation string, an object string, or some other strings. And uh, after we do the pre-training, we will freeze the GNN weights and then train the extraction layer for closed IE or open IE tasks. Okay. So now uh, this is regarding what results we have got and uh, our latest techniques. Are we there yet? So um, there are several future works. First, uh, we still get quite low quality uh, precision for open IE and for new domains. Can we improve the extraction precision to above 90%? because in industry, that's the minimum for consideration of uh, production. And here we can possibly, for example, combine the zero shot learning with distance supervision. And second, um, inspired by BERT embedding, et cetera, can we learn some representations for the semi-structured data to support not only information extraction, but other applications such as question answering, search, and so on. And finally, can we align the knowledge from millions of the sources after we do the extraction? Can we link the entities across different sources and types? And can we align the relations in OpenIE? Here I have some uh, shameless advertisement for a paper presentation uh, we have for tomorrow. This is regarding entity linkage. Okay, several takeaways. We aim at harvesting knowledge from all of the semi-structured data on the web, and we aim at high accuracy. And meanwhile, we are open to extract new entities and new relationships. I want to uh, let you know two benchmark data sets. Uh, we extended the SWDE benchmark for uh, knowledge extraction from semi-structured websites. And in addition, we have this uh, data integration to knowledge graph challenge data set, which not only provides you the extraction data set, but also for entity linkage and for schema mapping. Okay, thank you very much. Uh,
any more questions, I guess there should already be questions on the chat channel. Wonderful. Yes, thank you, Luna, so much. Um, um, there you. are uh, many questions uh, here. So the question at the top is, the Google Knowledge Vault project was halted. Information extraction into KG at Amazon seems to be working better. Is this true? And what technical differences are there in the problem setting or methods? Okay, um, that's a great question. And uh, so uh, for Google Knowledge Graph, it gives birth to a whole set of, uh, I mean, Google Knowledge Vault, it gives ber uh, birth to a whole set of technologies. And some of the underlying techniques are um, launched in uh, some of the Google applications, production applications. Uh, for example, for Google Assistant. And um, there are two lessons uh, I personally learned from that project. The first one is we need to get really high precision. And this is why I have been emphasizing 90% precision all the time. And the second lesson I learned is uh, Knowledge Vault uh, does not extract knowledge for new entities and for new relations. So all of the knowledge is among existing entities in Knowledge Graph in Freebase. And uh, consider those like popular entities. We already know all of the popular um, facts and uh, what we could extract automatically from the web are oftentimes the long tail knowledge for popular entities. It is not really required or like in demand that much. And uh, for this new project, the Ceres project, we focus on identifying new entities and even new relationships because those long tail entities, when we get popular facts for those long tail entities, actually collectively, it can be a lot of um, impact. Thank you. Next question. Products are particularly strong examples of entities at multiple levels of granularity that Jamie Taylor described in his talk, mentioning Beethoven's Knife and its different versions. Um, your thoughts about this for products, I suppose. Sure, uh, that's a good question. So for products, we seldom say, okay, uh, these two, five different products, we consider them as uh, different as far as, as a um, like a customer, you get one of them, you get the second of them, you cannot distinguish it. So uh, we do not make that kind of distinction. And then it is much more of, um, if we say it is the same uh, product, if, it, uh, if you get it and you cannot distinguish it and you feel happy. On the other hand, this uh, different granularity actually appears a lot for product types. And uh, I believe it or not, we have uh, 100,000 different product types at Amazon catalog, and we are still able to identify more. And that gives huge challenge in terms of automatically um, construct and enrich the taxonomy and um, also uh, categorize each product to oftentimes multiple different categories. And the third, when we train any imputation and a cleaning model, uh, how to make it work for hundreds of thousands of different product types because, because each one has its unique feature. Right. I just follow up on that. I imagine that in some cases, two products that would be highly related, like a recording of the same symphony, but on CD versus some other format, yes. uh, maybe yes. should appear on the same product page. And then for some other products, they should be made separate based on similarly similar attributes. This happens sure. and how are these decisions made? Yes, yeah. So this is what we call uh, variations. For example, we could have a whole bunch of different tide detergents uh, that have different scents and sizes, but that's the only difference. And certainly different customers will have different preference, but normally uh, the price will be quite similar. And also the comments for this, uh, like um, uh, customer reviews for these uh, products in the same family would be quite similar. And uh, this is actually a perfect advertisement uh, for our paper that will be presented tomorrow. Excellent, wonderful. All right, next question. You mentioned BERT embeddings as input to your GNN training. BERT is often great for context-sensitive embeddings, 
Does that matter here for such short fields? That's a good question. And uh, so we use the pre-trained bird embedding. So we can tell, for example, a director and a directed by this have some similarities and they are likely to be predicates. And on the other hand, the names, they are person names, etc. they are likely to be uh, the objects. And uh, we see uh, more um, improvement for uh, closed IE, but the less for open IE. I see, right. So even if the text you're representing is just very short, there are just a few, one or two words of context still trying to tell them. That's true. All yeah. right, yeah. All right, the last question here on the list here, just with the right amount of time. William Cohen's invited talk discussed answering queries requiring multi-hop logical reasoning. Do you think Amazon users would use this? And what would its technical requirements be? So what I found is uh, whatever William Cohen said, this will be either useful now or useful, very useful in five years. So I wouldn't question that. And in addition, I really like uh, the morning session uh, from uh, William, from Yuri regarding uh, using, considering uh, multi-hop QA as knowledge inference. And I can see a lot of um, uh, interesting applications out of it. Wonderful. Luna, thank you so much. I will clap for the thank large you. audience that we have here all together. And turn Thanks a lot. back over to Samir or the program chair, I don't know which, uh, um, to describe next steps. Thank you again, Luna. Thank you, Luna. Uh, Thanks. Now we're just going to have our hallway chats. Um, and I think uh, there are virtual booths there for people to attend. There are invited speakers who will be available to chat. I think Yura is going to be late by 30 minutes. Um, and there's also a random chat session as well. So I encourage everyone to go there, hang out, uh, talk to invited speakers more. And uh, we'll see you in the live session tomorrow morning. Thank you.